Finance Committee will come to order, and we are happy to welcome the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen this morning. Everyone here, regardless of political views, understands that the FDIC, the Fed, and the Treasury Department are putting in long hours to contain the fallout of the recent bank closures. The process is moving forward under existing law. Investigations are underway at the SEC and the Department of Justice. Senator Brown, chair of the Banking Committee and a valued member of this committee, is determined to get to the bottom of exactly what went wrong. Nerves are certainly frayed at this moment. One of the most important steps the Congress can take now is to make sure there are no questions about the full faith and credit of the United States. That means paying the bills incurred by presidents of both parties and taking a default off the table. With respect to the budget debate, after a request from myself and Senator Whitehouse, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office did the math on the recent fiscal promises we've heard from House Republicans. The promises pile up, but the numbers don't add up. They wish to balance the budget in 10 years, but they've announced a long list of untouchables. No reductions in defense, no cuts to Medicare or Social Security, no touching veterans programs, no asking the wealthy or corporations to pay their fair share. A couple of these items could get bipartisan support, certainly not all of them. Senator Whitehouse and I asked the Congressional Budget Office to run the numbers. Is it even possible for Republicans to stand behind those commitments? Does the math add up? Madam Secretary, you and I have talked about this. The numbers don't add up, not even close. What the Budget Office found is that for Republicans to make the math work, they'd have to cut every federal program by 86%. Goodbye to Medicaid and the guarantee of nursing home coverage, which I saw when I was director of the Great Panthers. The border would be unprotected. Roads and bridges would crumble. If Republicans wanted to extend the Trump tax law, they'd have to cut everything else. Given that, it's not a big mystery why House Republicans haven't yet put a budget on, on paper, budget to show the public. They're living way, way out there. Democrats are following a smarter approach. The president has put out a budget that's based on a simple proposition. Help working families, help the middle class get ahead, reduce the deficit at the same time, and show that these matters are not mutually exclusive. I'm just going to highlight a few budget um, matters that are high, important to the Treasury. First, last week, the committee had a very good bipartisan hearing on affordable housing. This is an area where I believe there's a clear opportunity for bipartisan cooperation. The budget proposes expanding the low-income housing tax credit, creating the neighborhood homes program, and other ideas. Senator Cantwell, Senator Cardin, Senator Young, they're championing bipartisan efforts. I'm going to work with them closely on these proposals and more. This crisis needs a solution. There is no substitute, and you and I have talked about this as well, Madam Secretary, for increasing supply of housing. Second, the budget calls for expanding two of the most significant sources of support for working people and families, the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit. When the Congress passed these expansions in 2021, there were huge, almost immediate reductions in poverty. With a little bit of help, millions of working Americans felt like they could breathe for the first time. I'd like for them to have that feeling of relief once again. And third, we've talked for a long time about the need to address the basic unfairness of America's two-tiered tax system. One set of rules for people who work for a living, firefighters, nurses, teachers, they pay their taxes out of every paycheck. Then there's another set of rules for the very wealthy who can pay what they want, when they want to, and for years on end, little or nothing. Although the President and I have proposed slightly different ideas for addressing the unfairness, we are rowing in the same direction. One final issue. I have got serious concerns about the administration's approach to implementing a portion of the Inflation Reduction Act that deals with sourcing critical minerals. 
free trade agreements cannot be unilaterally decided by the executive branch. They require consultation and consent from the Congress. That includes any agreement on critical minerals. Secretary Yellen, thank you again for being uh, with us. I know you've got a hectic schedule. We're going to have a wide-ranging uh, discussion. We look forward to questions and answers, and I understand that you've got a hard stop at uh, 1 o'clock, so we'll all try to keep them short and get to questions. Senator Crapo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to today's hearing, Secretary Yellen. I appreciate your appearing before the committee in this timely manner following the release of the President's budget. While the budget is the focus of today's hearing, I expect that the emergency measures that have been taken this weekend by Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and the FDIC will also be appropriately discussed today. It's important to learn more about what initiated the run on Silicon Valley Bank, the impact of the Federal Reserve holding interest rates low for too long, and what steps were or were not taken by the SVB and the banking regulators. In the meantime, I'm concerned about the precedent of guaranteeing all deposits and the market expectation moving forward. Once started, moral hazard, like inflation, is not easily contained and does, does long-lasting damage. Inflation played a key role in the recent bank failures as rising interest rates and mismanaged interest rate risk led to a liquidity crisis. Indeed, there is no issue more critical than the unacceptably high inflation that American families continue to face every day. Amen. Americans have now experienced 16 months of inflation at or above 6%. Costs of rent, groceries, and services continue to rise. Wages cannot keep up. Last year, the administration committed to working in a bipartisan fashion to address this serious problem, noting that the budget must complement monetary policy. Instead, what we've seen is a reckless tax and spend agenda that was forced through Congress, rolling out trillions of dollars in debt finance spending and hundreds of billions of dollars in new tax increases on U.S. job creators. The Congressional Budget Office says the Inflation Reduction Act will not only increase inflation in the near term, but Treasury will collect less corporate tax revenue with the partisan IRA in effect, despite being sold as a bill to make corporations pay their fair share. The Federal Reserve is having to compensate for this by growing interest rate hikes. Rising interest rates are impacting household budgets, the federal government's coffers, and as we saw this week, our banking system. The President's budget demonstrates the administration has not learned from its mistakes. After two years of policies that contributed to record high inflation and excessive deficit spending, this administration is doubling down with this budget with more of the same. The spending binge must stop. We must address our growing deficits in order to put the United States finances on a sustainable path and pro-growth tax policy should be a part of that solution. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act led to one of the strongest economies in generations. The TCJA introduced competitive tax rates while broadening the base, including by enacting the first global minimum tax of its kind and putting an end to corporate inversions. It also contributed to record high corporate tax receipts, both nominally and as a share of gross domestic product. But instead of considering bipartisan pro-growth policies, the President's budget includes a whopping $4.7 trillion of new and increased taxes on American job creators, which ultimately means fewer jobs and lower wages. It also includes higher taxes on American energy producers. Earlier today, Senator Barrasso and a number of his Republican colleagues, including myself, sent a letter to you, Secretary Yellen, raising concerns with the over $100 billion in increased energy taxes proposed in the President's fiscal year 24 budget, 2024 budget. And Mr. Chairman, I ask that this letter be included in. Without objection, so ordered. The administration's short-sighted partisan agenda extends to its unilateral approach to the OECD international tax agreement. For the last two years, Treasury has used the OECD negotiations to attempt to compel changes in U.S. law without regard for U.S. revenue, for U.S. companies, and U.S. workers. 
Not only has the administration failed to put a stop to digital tax serv services taxes, but now foreign countries threaten to impose extraterritorial taxes on U.S. companies under the global minimum tax at Treasury's invitation. The latest OEC guidance confirms the administration has agreed to allow foreign countries to collect U.S. guilty revenue and worse, tax U.S. companies on their U.S. profits in violation of our existing tax treaties. The budget fails to consider these revenue impacts, which if implemented will result in billions of dollars of lost U.S. revenue. Meanwhile, the administration continues to hide its true intentions for transforming the IRS. The budget doubles down on the $80 billion already given to the IRS, including two more additional years of plus-up funding, totaling $29.1 billion solely for enforcement and compliance initiatives, in addition to $14.1 billion more of yearly funding. That's another $43 billion. Secretary Yellen, I agree with you that having a funding plan for an agency budget that dwarves many others is critical. In the meantime, the IRS has embarked on a spend first, plan later approach that is not transparent or responsible and is a surefire recipe for error, waste, and mismanagement. While we may not have the details yet, we do know that only 6% of this existing plus up for funding is for modernization while over 62% is solely for hiring, more than 93% of that enforcement hiring. These new funds are not going to replace retiring U.S. agents, as annual appropriations already provide that funding. And the administration has not requested any reductions in IRS annual funding to account for replacing retirees with this plussed up funding. Secretary Yellen, there are opportunities for the administration to work across the aisle on common sense economic policies, but nothing suggests the president is abandoning the partisan tax and spend policies of the last two years. This administration must recommit to working with Republicans to develop real solutions that will stabilize the economy and create higher wages and opportunities for American workers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Service. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Crapo. Our witness today will be Secretary Janet Yellen. She's the first person to have led the White House Council of Economic Advisors, the Federal Reserve, and the Treasury Department. She's also the first woman to lead the Treasury Department. Before leading Treasury in the Federal Reserve, she was a distinguished fellow in residence at the Brookings Institution. She served as president of the American Economic Association. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Science and the Council on Foreign Relations. She also was a founding member of the Climate Leadership uh, Council. We welcome you, uh, Secretary Yellen, and please proceed. Thank you. Chairman Wyden, uh, Ranking to... Member Crapo, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today. I'd like to start with an update on the recent developments in the banking system. This week, the government took decisive and forceful actions to stabilize and strengthen public confidence in our financial system. First, we worked with the Federal Reserve and FDIC to protect all depositors of the two failed banks. On Monday morning, customers were able to access all of the money in their deposit accounts so they could make payroll and pay the bills. Shareholders and debt holders are not being protected by the government. Importantly, no taxpayer money is being used or put at risk with this action. Deposit protection is provided by the Deposit Insurance Fund, which is funded by fees on banks. Second, the Federal Reserve is providing additional support to the banking system with a new lending facility. This will help financial institutions meet the needs of all of their depositors. I can reassure the members of the committee that our banking system is sound and that Americans can feel confident that their deposits will be there when they need them. This week's actions demonstrate our resolute commitment to ensure that our financial system remains strong and that depositors' savings remain safe. Now let me turn to the topic of the hearing, the President's fiscal year 2024 budget. 
Over the past two years, the United States has experienced an historic economic recovery. In January 2021, our country was in the middle of an economic calamity triggered by the coronavirus pandemic. But Congress and the President took decisive action through the American Rescue Plan and our vaccination campaign. And today, our unemployment rate is near historic lows. And we've seen the strongest two years of business creation in history. Now our task is to navigate our economy's transition from rapid recovery to sustainable growth. This includes bringing down inflation. We have seen some moderation in headline inflation, but more work needs to be done. Our administration will continue to build on the actions we have taken to expand supply and provide cost relief in areas like energy and health care. With your partnership, we have also laid a foundation for long-term economic growth. In just the past two years alone, Congress passed three transformational laws, a generational investment in infrastructure, an historic expansion of American semiconductor manufacturing, and the largest investment in clean energy in our nation's history. The strategic priority for our administration this year is to work with you to effectively implement these laws. We're seeing the early results. In just seven months, there's been a wave of investments in clean energy manufacturing across the country. And our new resources for the IRS are already paying off. Taxpayers are getting drastically improved customer service this year. For example, we have answered hundreds of thousands more phone calls during this filing season than at this time last year. Our proposed budget builds on our economic progress by making smart, fiscally responsible investments. These investments would be more than fully paid for by requiring corporations and the wealthiest to pay their fair share. Fiscal discipline remains a central priority in our budget. We have proposed a minimum income tax of 25% on taxpayers with wealth in excess of $100 million. We have also proposed an increase of the corporate tax rate to 28% from the current 21%. And it will come as no surprise that I hope Congress will implement the United States's part of the global minimum tax deal. On the spending side, we suggest additional investments to boost our long-term growth potential. This includes improving the availability of high-quality child care, providing free and universal preschool, and boosting the supply of affordable housing. We also propose restoring the child tax credit and earned income tax credit expansions that were enacted in 2021 but have since expired. Importantly, with the proposed tax reforms, we estimate that this budget will deliver deficit reduction of nearly $3 trillion over the next 10 years. Thank you, and I look forward to taking your question. Thank, thank you, Secretary Yellen. Let me begin with what I emphasized that it's critically important that Congress takes steps to make sure there's no questions about the full faith and credit of the United States. And this is a matter within the Finance Committee's jurisdiction. Now, on Friday, the House Ways and Means Republicans passed a plan dealing with what they call priority, prioritizing payments by the Treasury. They say that when Treasury runs out of stopgap funding, it should prioritize payments to Wall Street and creditors in China ahead of everybody else. I'm coming off some town hall meetings in Oregon this weekend. Wouldn't be a big hit with everybody. Now, setting aside the merits of this Republican plan, does the federal government have the technical capacity to prioritize some payments ahead of others? I understand there's not even a precedent for this. The government, on average, makes millions of payments each day, and our systems are built to pay all of our bills on time and not to pick and choose which bills to pay. There is a reason that Treasury secretaries of both parties have rejected this incredibly risky 
and dangerous idea, and it's never been tried before. I cannot give any assurances about the technical feasibility of such a plan. It would be an exceptionally risky, untested, and radical departure from normal payment practices of agencies across the federal government. And I consider it essential that Congress come together to recognize that raising the debt ceiling is their responsibility to protect the full faith and credit in the United States. So you've told us this prioritization scheme is unworkable and House Republicans don't get to decide what qualifies as a federal default. If the government can meet some but not all of its obligations, isn't that essentially the definition of a default? Failing to pay your bills is what I, all of your bills when they're due is what I think of as a default. The United States has always paid all of its bills on time and it should stay that way and that's been a core American value since 1789 regardless of party, presidents and congresses have always honored all of our commitments and prioritization is effectively a default by a number, by just another name. I appreciate you bringing us up to date on that, Madam Secretary and colleagues. The reason I focused on protecting the full faith and credit of the United States is this is explicitly within this committee's jurisdiction. So I thank you, Secretary Yellen. Let's talk about the double standard in tax enforcement. Too much of the burden falls on working people in the middle class. It's too easy for corporations and the wealthy to get away with cheating every time out. Uh, it seems that Republicans are trying hard to keep it that way. They put an amendment to the IRA that according to the Congressional Budget Office would have led to even more tax avoidance by the wealthy. It would have encouraged billionaires to disguise their income so they'd appear to the IRS to be typical middle class wage earners. There have even been Republican efforts to speed up hiring the kind of highly trained and dogged experts that you need to crack down on tax cheating by the wealthy and businesses that have very complicated business structures. And of course, the first bill out of the gate in the House was this $114 billion giveaway to the wealthy tax cheats and the tax dodging corporations. They would have, in, in effect, repealed the funding Democrats passed in the Inflation Reduction Act. Secretary Yellen, if Republicans had their way and repealed the IRS funding to go after wealthy you know, tax cheats, what would that do to the agency's ability to really make sure that those people at the very top paid their fair share? Well, it would allow the wealthy and large corporations to skip out on taxes they legally owe and make life harder for ordinary middle class families who pay their taxes to get the kind of service that they deserve from the IRS and it would increase the tax gap and add to the deficit by over $114 billion. So let's talk about improvements in taxpayer um, services. Now, the IRS funding as of early March, the IRS was answering 90% of the calls to its customer service lines and had the backlog of individual returns reduced substantially in the ballpark of 90%. Now that's after spending roughly 1% of the IRA funding. Secretary Yellen, if Republicans were able to successfully repeal the Inflation Reduction Act funding, what would that mean for taxpayer services? And the reason I ask that is right now we're in the middle of the filing season. So this isn't some kind of abstract kind of concern. What would it mean for taxpayer services well, if they repealed the funding? Well, it just clearly would lead to worse services for taxpayers, phones would go unanswered, wait times would grow, mail would be processed more slowly, refunds would be delayed. Um, we're undergoing a transition to digital forms and improved scanning would be delayed, paper backlogs would grow, and taxpayer assistance centers are now being reopened and fully staffed and some of them would have to close or be understaffed. I'm over my time. Senator Crapo. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me start out, uh, Madam Secretary, with the full faith and credit issue that uh, my colleague Senator Wyden has raised. We are in agreement that we need to protect the full faith and credit of the United States. Uh, frankly, as I indicated in my opening statement, the problem that we see on the Republican side is that it's all tax and all spending increases in terms of the administration's approach to this. And while uh, you and the chairman just discussed a number of concerns you have with Republican ideas with regard to how to deal with this, the bottom line is that we must stop trying to solve this problem by massive new spending and massive new taxes. So we have some disagreements about how to deal with this. What I would ask of you is, at this point, the president has refused to negotiate with Republicans on fiscal restraint policies that they believe need to be put into place with a, with a new extension of the debt ceiling. We must engage in negotiations to get over some of these disagreements, and this new debt ceiling resolution must include fiscal restraint. We've got to get some kind of attention to this. I think the American public is crying out for Congress to pay attention to this issue and put fiscal restraint in place. Can you commit at least to negotiate with Republicans as we try to work forward on finding some aspects of fiscal restraint to put into the debt ceiling discussion? Senator Crapo, the president has indicated that he considers it critically important to have a sustainable and responsible fiscal path. And he's put on the table in the budget um, a number of ideas, many ideas about how to grow the economy while also cutting deficits. And this is a matter that he is very prepared to discuss and negotiate with Republicans, but it can't be a condition for raising the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling simply must be raised, and to put at risk uh, the full faith and credit of the United States and to threaten to cause an economic and financial catastrophe isn't an acceptable well, I, um, Madam Secretary, requirement. I, understand, I interpret your answer to be that you're very willing to discuss the president's budget, tax increases, and increased spending, but you're not willing to discuss with regard to the debt ceiling discussion, any actual fiscal restraint in terms of spending control in the United States. Now, if I interpreted it wrong, I'm sorry, but we've got to get negotiating on more than just whether the president's budget is the right approach. There are other ideas, and we need to be engaged in it. I just hope that you'll take that message back to the president. The president has indicated that he would welcome discussions about the stance of fiscal policy. All right, I appreciate that. Let's move uh, quickly to the uh, SVB crisis in, in the banking industry. Can we agree, at least as a starter, as we try to understand how this is all playing out, that the issue here in terms of risk is uh, liquidity risk that we are facing in the system and that SVB had a, an, a liquidity risk issue? Well, there was a, a run on the bank. It had high reliance on uninsured deposits, and um, there was a massive withdrawal of deposits that led to liquidity problems. The bank had to be closed for that reason. So do you agree, then, that it is a liquidity risk that we're dealing with in this issue? Well, there was a liquidity risk in this situation. I, um, you know, there. There will be a careful look at what happened in the bank and what initiated this problem, but clearly the downfall of the bank, the reason it had to be closed, was that it couldn't meet depositors' um, depositors' withdrawal requests. Because their capital was, being, uh, was losing value and they were not able to access their capital, and, and I attribute that to the interest rate hikes that we are seeing in in the face of the inflation. Am I wrong in that? Well, my understanding is that the bank, um, to meet liquidity needs, had to sell um, assets that it expected to hold to maturity. And um, given the interest rate increases that have occurred since those assets, including treasuries and government-backed um, security, mortgage-backed securities, 
they had lost market value. All right, yeah, and we're on the same page on that then. I appreciate that. One other question with regard to the uh, bank failure, and a this is with regard to the efforts to get a private buyer to help solve this issue. Uh, regarding these uh, issues, the solution would have been to get a private sector solution that protected taxpayers, calmed the markets, and prevented the potential assessments from being inappropriately levity, levied against community banks. Uh, press reports have indicated that some, at the, uh, some of the FDIC board members may have slow walked the negotiations with regard to potential political backlash surrounding mergers and acquisitions. And uh, it was because of that that we were not able to move forward promptly with obtaining a buyer. Are those reports accurate? Well, this is something that uh, is a question for the FDIC, really, rather than me. But I, I know that the FDIC um, looked, looked for buyers, and a merger or acquisition is certainly uh, something that they were open to as a way to resolve the institution. All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> very quickly, on the OECD agreement, uh, I'm very much opposed to it, and yet it seems to me that Treasury is uh, pushing for Congress to approve its approach to the OECD negotiations and is already giving uh, support to nations around the world in the OECD to tax U.S. profits that would be directly in contrast or in conflict with U.S. tax treaties. Um, am I correct in that? 137 countries signed this agreement and see it as a way to put a floor on taxation of corporations and uh, multinational corporations and stop a race to the bottom. And the European Union has adopted uh, pillar two, the global minimum tax, and I, other jurisdictions are moving forward. My and question, we my feel answer, it's I, in the U.S. interest to adopt this. We have, um, we have proposed. Um, I understand, Madam Secretary. My time has expired, and the chairman's trying to get me to wrap up. I do want to make one more quick statement. Uh, I would like to express my concern about numerous proposals in the Green Book in the budget that we won't have time to get into here today. Last year, Treasury did not provide answers to these questions for the record responses for six months. And I just would like to ask you to pay attention to this this, this year and have your team respond to us promptly as we get questions for the record on this year's budget. Senator Grafley. Yeah. You didn't answer his last question about OECD and tax treaties. Uh, is what you're proposing in any way a violation of the tax uh, treaties that we've had with other countries? No, there's no violation in anything we've proposed with um, ta tax treaties that we've engaged in. This is something that the OECD considered very carefully and there's no violation of our tax treaty. Well, we surely don't agree with your analysis of that. Only Congress has the power to approve tax uh, treaties. Uh, I want to go to your uh, position as a member of the Social Security Board of Trustees. You and other people put out an annual report, uh, quote, lawmakers should address the projected trust fund shortfalls in a timely way in order to phase in necessary changes gradually and give workers and beneficiaries time to adjust to them, end of quote. I don't disagree at all with that statement. President Biden has claimed that his budget reduces the deficits while protecting Social Security. However, the president's budget includes no proposal to extend the solvency of the Social Security Trust Fund. Anyone who knows that things get done around here know what takes presidential leadership to lead major reforms to Social Security. Forty years ago, that was a President Reagan and a Democrat Speaker of the House, uh, Tip O'Neill, that put together a bipartisan agreement that was overwhelmingly approved by the Congress of the United States, and, it's, and it has made Social Security sound uh, at least through 2035. So I assume that you stand by your recommendations that lawmakers act sooner rather than later to shore up Social Security trust funds. So can Congress expect to see the President's proposal to put Social Security on a sound fiscal basis uh, along the same ways replicating the leadership of President 
uh, Reagan and Tip O'Neill. President Biden stands ready to work with Congress to shore up Social Security and discuss possible approaches. So that's a conversation that it's important for us to have. Um, he has made explicit proposals yeah. in connection with uh, Medicare and shoring it up. Yeah. Um, and um, it's important to have that conversation about Social Security. The President believes strongly that that should not involve cutting benefits or going back on our commitments to America's uh, seniors, but certainly it's a discussion we need to have. I assume that both you and the President are sincere in what you just said. It would help a lot if the President would quit demagoguing the Social Security issue the way he has in recent weeks. I want to go to uh, an extension of conversation you and I had June of 2021. Uh, you defended concerns about the President's spending proposals fueling inflation and interest rates hikes by saying this, quote, if we ended up with a slightly higher interest rate environment, it would actually be a plus for society's point of view and the Fed's point of view, end of quote. Uh, I want to emphasize plus for a society's point of view. Now, when you made that statement, inflation was 5.4% and the federal funds rate was effectively zero. Since that time, inflation hit a 40-year high and the Fed has responded by aggressively hiking interest rates. As a result, families and small businesses are paying the price by way of higher interest rate costs for home loans and business lines of credit. Moreover, bank failures this past week highlighted how fragile our economy is given rising interest rates and decades-long inflation. So do you still see our inflation-driven interest rates hike as, using your words, a plus for society? I consider high inflation um, the number one economic problem that all of us need to face and address. It's the President's top priority. Um, I was very supportive of the American Rescue Plan. Um, I, I think there are many factors that have contributed to high inflation. It's critical for the Fed to address it, and the President is doing all that he can, both through the Inflation Reduction Act, lowering costs of prescription drugs, uh, lowering the cost of health care, Mm -hmm. um, using the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to uh, try to lower and address um, higher gas and energy costs for Americans. Um, it, it's critical for us to do what we can to bring inflation down and for the Fed to do its part as well. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act um, was enacted at a time when I believe the greatest threat to our economy was that unemployment would remain shockingly high and that American families would be scarred by long-term job loss and losing the roofs over their heads. And I believe it was appropriate to take those actions. My time has run out. Just let me finally say this, that uh, what you say about the Inflation Reduction Act, reducing inflation within the last three weeks, the CBO says that increased inflation. I yield. Thank, thank you, Senator Grassley. Senator Cardin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Secretary Yellen. Welcome. Thank you very much for your service. I I'm going to question in regards to areas where we have bipartisan support, where we can, I hope, make progress in this Congress in getting some changes in our tax code, particularly as it deals with one of the subjects that you mentioned in your opening statement, affordable housing. We have fallen behind in affordable housing. We were able to make progress in a lot of areas during the last two years, but affordable housing was not one of those areas where we were able to advance. So your budget includes three initiatives in which there is bipartisan support. One is to make permanent the new market tax credits. Um, I'm working with Senator Daines on that proposal to give predictability to new market tax credits, which would be great for, I think, private sector investment. The other is low-income housing tax credit, where your budget provides for the expansion uh, and reform of that credit. Uh, Senator Cantwell and Senator Young have been leaders on this committee. We've joined them in that effort. 
And then lastly, on the neighborhood homes credit, which I have been the sponsor and, and Senator Young is my co-sponsor. So these are all bipartisan bills that we have a chance of moving forward. My suggestion is to try to see whether we can't move a housing tax credit program separate from the other areas where we might have more controversy. This is an area we could perhaps get to the finish line earlier. So could we have your cooperation in trying to deal with a housing tax credit bill that could perhaps uh, make it to the president's desk earlier rather than later? Absolutely, Senator Cardin. I'm very pleased that this is an area where there is bipartisan agreement on the need to act. I think the United States really faces a housing supply gap, and um, we need initiatives to make rents more affordable and um, attainable home ownership for Americans. And all of the programs that you mentioned, the New Markets uh, Tax Credit, uh, LIHTC, and the Neighborhood Homes Tax Credit, all of these are important initiatives, and we would look forward to working with uh, Congress to uh, try to see if we can make progress here. Thank you. Uh, I want to move on uh, to another bipartisan bill that passed in the last Congress uh, with overwhelming support uh, in retirement savings, Secure 2.0. Uh, are you focused on helping us implement that law as quickly as possible? It provides opportunities for particularly modest income families to be able to take advantage of retirement savings opportunities, particularly with the refundable tax credits. Are, are you working to make the, the implementation of that law as smooth as possible so we can see some progress? Yes, absolutely. It's an important law. Um, it contains many provisions that are complex and do require detailed technical analysis to produce public guidance and regulations, but th this is something that we're working hard on, and the IRS and Treasury Office of Tax Policy are working to implement this. And another area where I think there's bipartisan support is improving the service at the IRS and the modernization uh, of its uh, capacities. The chairman already mentioned uh, the fact that you've made some progress. Actually, the call, uh, uh, the successful answering of calls has dramatically been increased. Uh, do you see continued progress being made in regards to the service levels being provided by the IRS as a result of funds made available through the Inflation Reduction Act? Absolutely. This will be a very critical part of the IRS strategic operating plan that um, should be completed in the coming weeks. It has been a priority since day one. Um, I promised during the tax season that there would be 85% um, um, customer service performance, and so far we have been in that range, and modernizing the way in which IRS interacts with taxpayers, with small businesses, um, there, there have already been other improvements put into, a, into effect that, for example, makes it easier for small businesses to file 1099 forms online, and this will be an important priority. I, I want to ask two questions for the record, if I just mention them. One will deal with the Section 179D allocations. I've worked with Senator Crapo on this. The guidance from the IRS is absolutely critical in regards to the allocation issue. I'll be asking a question for the record on that. And also, you mentioned small businesses. The R&D changes in the 2017 tax bill have been very much impacting the, the ability of companies to do research. I chaired a small business committee. It's having a direct impact on the SBIR program, which is critically important for innovation and for national defense, I might say. So I'll be asking you questions as to how we can mitigate the adverse impact of the change in the R&D credit as it affects small companies in the SBIR program. Th thank you, Senator Cardin. And this committee is really going to dig in on this housing issue. And my view is we start with the proposition. The only matter that's off the table is taking a pass on it. We've got to act. Senator Cornyn, you're next. Good morning, Madam Secretary. When you uh, testified before this committee almost two years ago, you were asked whether inflation was transitory. And you told the committee that you saw important transitory influences at work. 
but you did not anticipate that inflation would be in any way permanent. You predicted our economy was on track to get back to more normal operation, and that inflation would decline over time, something we all hoped for. To be fair, you weren't the only person who forecast transitory inflation. The chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jay Powell, did the same as did the President of the United States. We now know that inflation rose to a level not seen in more than 40 years, and that inflation accelerated, particularly following the enactment of the partisan American Rescue Plan Act in 2021, and then with the so-called Inflation Reduction Act in 2022, which together added $2.6 trillion to our national debt. Obviously, all this stimulus going into a constrained economy with supply chains uh, the way they were, um, workforce levels down, obviously created, uh, port was like pouring gasoline on the inflation fire. And though inflation has now come down to 6% or so, that's hardly good news to my constituents who are still struggling to keep up with rising costs. We know both record housing costs, which we've talked about a little bit here today, and high grocery bills are squeezing consumers all across the country. And to make matters worse, real average hourly earnings, the cash earnings of all workers adjusted for inflation, declined last month and are down over the last year. In other words, because of inflation, workers have gotten a pay cut. Well, first we saw high inflation and then higher interest rates, of course. And uh, that brings me to the failure of the, uh, of the Silicon Valley Bank and another bank in this last week. Some have suggested that this was an example of mismanagement at the time of higher interest rates and higher inflation. Others are saying, where are the regulators? Were they asleep at the wheel? Many have suggested that banking regulators need to focus more on regulating banks, protecting depositors and taxpayers instead of straying off course and examining so-called climate-related risks and other social engineering goals. I think these are all fair points. When you look at the confluence of concerning economic factors, there is one unavoidable truth. We need to get our fiscal house in order, something that the administration pays lip service to, but which seems uninterested in working with Republicans to try to address. And uh, the president's budget proposal, of course, just makes that clear, because it offers more taxes, more spending, and more debt. Spending would be at historical levels relative to the economy. The national debt would continue to grow. Social Security and Medicare, which are on a path to insolvency, there is no proposal from the president to deal with these, these uh, impending disasters. Of course, interest costs to service this debt um, would reach about a trillion dollars annually. Our ability to defend our country in an increasingly dangerous world would be diminished because we'd be spending more money paying interest to the bondholders rather than paying to keep the American people safe. And Americans, of course, would be punished with trillions in higher taxes at a time when tax revenues are already at historical levels. It's not that the American people are taxed too little. It's that the federal government continues to spend too much and spend too, and, and incur too much debt, which in turn creates this unvirtuous cycle. One final point. Last uh, year, the administration pushed through an 80 billion dollar blank check for the IRS without a spending plan. Only in Washington, D.C. would Congress pass an $80 billion spending uh, appropriation without any plan as to how it's going to be implemented. And we were told, well, it will be forthcoming. That's great, but that's the opposite of what you would do it in the real world. First, you would not want to know what is the plan, and then you would ask how much does it take to finance or pay for that plan. Well, now the administration wants another $29 billion, which would bring the total up to $110 billion. Uh, this, of course, is going to mean more audits, more red tape, and violate 
the president's promise that uh, no one paying less than $400,000 in taxes uh, would pay any more. So unfortunately, the president's budget misses the mark, uh, which is disappointing, but unfortunately pretty consistent with what we've seen from this administration. Thank you, Senator Cornyn. Next would be Senator Bennett, followed by Senator Cassidy. I'm going to yield to Mr. Cassidy if that's all right. Nobody can say there's no collegiality Thank in you. the finance. I'll, I'll take Senator, it Senator Cassidy. Thank you. Um, Madam Secretary, the president keeps saying he does not wish to have cuts in, in uh, social. Is he aware that under current law, when the program goes broke in nine years, that there will be a 24% benefit cut for those who are current recipients? Is he aware of that? Well, it's clear that Social Security... But is he... I apologize for interruption, but I have limited time. Is the president aware that when Social goes broke in nine years, under current law, there's a 24% cut in benefits for people who are currently receiving? If we don't do anything about it, I think that's about right. But okay, let me the ask. president will want wants to strengthen Social Security. And, and the four point sure five happen. trillion dollars of taxes the president has proposed, are any of those taxes going to shore up Social Security? I actually know that answer. The answer is of the four point five trillion in taxes he has proposed, not a dime is going to shore up Social Security. Does the president know personally anybody who is dependent upon Social Security, and if their benefits are cut by 24%, they will slide into poverty? It's hard for you to know, uh, so I'll give you a sure pass on that. The president knows many people on Social Security. Then why doesn't the president care? He cares very deeply. Then where is his plan? He stands ready to work with Congress That's a lie, to address. because when a bipartisan group of senators has repeatedly requested to meet with him about social, so that somebody who is a current beneficiary will not see her benefits cut by 24%, we have not heard anything on our request. And we've made multiple requests to meet with the president. Now, I, you can't comment on that, I realize that, but that is a fact. And if you've been told to say he stands ready to meet, I will tell you there's absolutely no evidence because we have not gotten our meeting. Well, I believe the president does stand ready to work well, again, with Congress empirically, that is not to address true. this issue. Um, now, the president in the past has proposed um, increasing taxes on those making over 400000 to pay for it. Although he's not made that formally, he has said that in the past. Um, now, he's also proposed to tax them more to pay for Medicare and also to close the debt and deficit. So what would the rates have to be on that 2% of Americans who earn over 400 k in order to do Medicare, the debt and deficit, and also to address our 75-year shortfall in Social Security? Do you have any sense of what the rates would have to be? Well, he has proposed explicit increases in tax rates on very high income. But do you think it's realistic that he can pay for Medicare debt and deficit and also address a 75% shortfall in social, a 75 year shortfall in social by only taxing, by only a going, the only thing he's going to do is to lay higher taxes on those who make more than 2%. I'm sure there's a projection of how much those rates would have to be. Do you, can you tell us what those rates would have to be to do everything he is saying? I, I can't tell you that, but I do know that he's put on the table many proposals that would raise very substantial revenues. But of that $4.5 trillion, not a dime is going to social. And if, you've not, if you cannot tell me, I presume that they've not actually modeled what those rates would have to be, which tells me that he's actually not been developing his plan. Now, this is incredibly worrisome from a president who should be sympathetic with someone who, under current law, is going to get a 24% cut the in her benefits. The president com is completely committed to protecting seniors who rely on Social Security. Now, if, if, if we doubled our debt-to-GDP ratio, um, just theoretically, 
if you will, an aside from our conversation. If we double that GDP to debt ratio, what effect would that have on the economy? So um, right now and in the president's mm -hmm. budget proposal, the- no, I'm gonna ask you just the theoretical independently of the budget proposal. If we were to double the debt to D GDP ratio? Yes. Um, I, I don't see why we would need- But to if double. we did, just, just, just you're an economist, if we did, what would be the effect upon the economy? Well, it would tend to raise net interest costs. Would it be a negative effect on the economy? Of course it would be. Of course, yes. Yeah, of course it would be. Uh, we've actually modeled this. For the president to do nothing, let's assume that we cast aside current law and we just double the national debt, and that's what it would do. Um, it would have a devastating effect upon the economy. CBO says they cannot model the deleterious effects that would occur because of that. So we have a situation where the president has not proposed a single plan. He has turned down multiple requests for meetings with senators, and our options are a 24% cut on the um, a person currently receiving, doubling our national debt, which CBO says cannot be modeled, and you agree that would be a deleterious effect. Um, uh, and he's not modeled the tax rates that would be required if he just wants to raise taxes. Look, what I know is that the president is committed to Social Security. He stands ready to work with Congress, and he's put on. I'm out of time. I don't mean many, to be rude, but since I've had multiple proposals. requests on a bipartisan basis to meet with him, and he's turned everyone down, that rings hollow. My, my, my colleagues out of time, and I would just caution colleagues. We got plenty of differences around here, but accusing witnesses of lying is over the line. I accept that, and I did not mean that for the Madam Secretary, who is merely saying that which she's been told. I'm saying it for a, a, an empiric observation. When the President says he's ready to meet, yeah, the, and he's the turned time, down multiple The time attacks. of the gentleman's expired, accusing witnesses of lying. But I did not accuse her. Next, we have Senator Carper. Well, welcome to the Finance Committee, Secretary uh, Yellen. Thank you very much. <laughs> We're normally a pretty jo jovial group, but uh, We'll get back on track here in a sec. But thanks, Seth. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for taking on a tough job and, uh, and uh, making us proud. As, uh, as you know, one of our country's most significant achievements, I believe, of the last decade or so uh, in Congress was the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, maybe right on the heels of the bipartisan infrastructure legislation that some of us right here at this t table helped to, uh, to write. Uh, in particular, the uh, clean energy tax incentives included in the, uh, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which were authorized and passed by this committee, and a bunch of us had a chance to work on them, will help us to achieve our climate goals and s hopefully save our planet, all while creating good paying jobs here in the United States. That's what we call in Delaware a win-win situation. However, in order to realize the full potential of the law, it's critical that the American people are not only made aware of these credits, but they, uh, they have a clear guidance on their eligibility to benefit from these credits. This is especially true for some of the provisions in the law that are targeted to uh, lower income and rural community. Uh, in that spirit, uh, how is the Treasury Department working to increase awareness of these new clean energy incentives and make it uh, as easy as possible for taxpayers to understand their eligibility for these credits? That's an important question, and let me just say that this is a very top priority for Treasury and our Office of um, Tax Policy. Um, there are enormous uh, benefits here for um, households um, and for clean energy. We need to write numerous regulations to implement the IRA programs from prevailing wage and apprenticeships to electric vehicles um, and advanced electric uh, energy proje projects. And we're working very hard on that guidance. And um, when we've devised those regulations, I think they will help to provide clarity that taxpayers need, make sure that the goals of the IRA um, are met, and um, we'll need to find ways of uh, publicizing those programs so that uh, taxpayers know what they're eligible for, um, 
There are benefits for investing, for example, in electric heat pumps or energy efficient appliances, and um, we'll need to work to make sure that this information is available to households so they can take advantage of these credits. Thanks, uh, thanks for that response. My second question, uh, also relating to the IRS, but IRS funding implementation. Another significant accomplishment included in the Inflation Reduction Act was the badly needed investment to revitalize the IRS, and one in part to help them provide better service to the people that are going to be calling them, especially as they prepare their tax re returns. But uh, as, as the chairman uh, mentioned earlier, taxpayers are already re reaping the rewards of this funding. And since the passage of the law the IRS has used, I'm told nearly $1 billion to boost taxpayer services, including hiring thousands of workers to help answer phone calls and support walk-in uh, tax clinics. And because of these investments, the IRS, listen, listen to this, this is worth listening to. Uh, the IRS is, I'm told, answering 98% uh, of the phone calls from the taxpayers seeking help during this fi filing season. I have a friend, you ask him how he's doing, he says, compared to what? Well, compared to about a year ago, um, that number was not 90 percent, it was 13 percent. That's, uh, and that's uh, not perfect, but it's a, one heck of a lot better than it was. Sure, yeah. And we're just getting started, and with the IRS Commissioner Danny Werfel at the helm, my thanks to everybody in this committee who supported his, his confirmation. These investments will ensure that the IRS can modernize their technology and their workforce to meet the needs of everyday taxpayers while improving the fairness of our tax system. Question, as the IRS puts this funding to work, how should policymakers like us evaluate the success of these critical investments and what outcomes can the American people expect in the years to come? Please. So um, a simple metric is um, customer service, um, what fraction of phone calls are answered, and you mentioned 13 percent. I promised uh, that this tax filing season with the money from the IRA that would rise to 85%. We've been measuring it, and it varies from week to week, but it's been consistently between 80 and 90%. And there are other metrics we can look at, speed of um, refunds that taxpayers re receive, um, backlogs in uh, the amount of paper that they're dealing with, and um, I believe this money will certainly lead to faster responses to taxpayers, more efficient um, and easier ways for them to, for example, deposit, deposit checks directly into their accounts. There, we will invent many metrics that I'm sure we'll be able to um, enable you to monitor how this money is improving. We welcome those service. metrics. Keep up the uh, keep us heading in the right direction. Um, it's very encouraging. I, I thank I thank my colleague Senator Bennett was gracious enough to give his time to Senator Cassidy. So the next three will be Senator Brown, Senator Thune, and then Senator Bennett. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Secretary Yellen. Thanks for your work uh, this weekend and our phone conversations and so much of what you did. Uh, for the financial system without taxpayers footing the bill. Thank you. And that I spoke to a number at your recommendation, really small businesses in Ohio that were worried about making payroll. They were all over the country. I, Senator Romney talked about his in Utah everywhere. Um, and I spoke to banks and credit unions who understand how important it was to have confidence and uh, the, what, what you did gave them that confidence, so thank you. Uh, bank failures are a painful reminder about the importance of strong safeguards. It's the same thing, maybe it's just what I'm thinking about so much, but it's the same thing when I think about the disaster in East Palestine. Uh, the railroad, railroad lobbyists continue just aggressively to lobby um, this body and to lobby the regulators, and they succeed in weaker standards for communities and for workers uh, and for railroad safety. We see the same kind of aggressive lobbying from bank lobbyists uh, to weaken standards. Uh, the, the administration weakened standards, the previous administration weakening uh, under 2155 those standards. So I um, I appreciate how you stand up strong on these issues. Um, I just today, earlier, you haven't seen it yet, I sent you and other regulators a letter urging you to do a full review of bank failures and strengthen guardrails so this doesn't happen again. So thank you what you what you have done and will continue to do there. Um, three pretty quick questions, I hope. 
Um, the, the Inflation Reduction Act created new tax credits to support the domestic solar industry. As Treasury finalizes rules, will you ensure that China's solar industry can't profit from these credits without developing a genuine domestic supply chain? Um, yes. The purpose of one purpose of IRA is to make sure that we reduce our dependence on China and have um, a strong domestic. Uh, capacity and uh, the features of the law uh, guarantee, guarantee that, and we're working on guidance to implement the law that will lead to that result. Thank you. Ohio has uh, the biggest solar, about to have the biggest solar manufacturer in North America. We will continue working on that. And, and Mr. Chairman, I, you know I can't come to this committee when Secretary Yellen is testifying and not bring up the child tax credit. Um, it, I, I want to thank you again for helping us. I mean, it was, it was uh, non, not unprecedented, but remarkable perhaps. We passed that bill in March. President, signed, President Biden signed it two years ago, uh, signed it uh, quickly. You got up and running the child tax credit by July. 60 million children and their families benefited from that. Um, it was so important. We've heard some on the other side that find all kinds of made up or partially made up reasons to oppose the child tax credit. They want to cut taxes, but not for middle income and low income families. Uh, President Trump's IRS commissioner asked Congress to give IRS the, necessity, the authority necessary to establish minimum competency standards for paid tax preparers. Uh, this, these, these issues about CTC and EITC error rates are always exaggerated by the other side. And my question is this, if paid tax preparers had to demonstrate a bare minimum expertise, do you think we'd see fewer errors with both the ITC and CTC? Do you think Congress should give IRS this authority? Yes, I believe that Congress should. I support that proposal. Um, at present, incompetent and dishonest paid preparers disadvantage taxpayers and undermine confidence in the tax system. And I believe IRS should have the authority to oversee paid preparers and make sure that they help taxpayers file more accurate returns. And in turn, that would protect them from penalties and interest costs from poor quality advice that some now receive. Thank you. I, I wish my colleagues were as interested in in tax cheating among billionaires as they were low-income people, but I guess that's just the way politics in 2023 seems to work. Uh, last question, I want to start, I want to let's ask you about another fiasco that should be easy to avoid, the debt limit. It's the definition of a self-inflicted blow to the economy. Instead of ensuring we avoid default by paying all our bills in time, some Republicans are pursuing a path we all know won't work, and I want you to comment on it. You said before that Debt prioritization isn't feasible. You've called it default by another name, your words. But Republicans are moving forward anyway with a bill that ranks what order payments should go out. They put Wall Street and China at the front of the line. If Treasury followed this Republican plan, bearing in mind that China holds about a trillion dollars in U.S. debt, who would get paid first, China or seniors receiving Social Security and bets receiving VA benefits? Well, if that were prioritized, China would get paid um, ahead of them. We, we believe, I believe, that prior, prioritization of payments, as you said, is default by another name. We need to pay our bills. We need to pay all of our bills. That um, willingness and commitment to be um, responsible in paying bills that have already been incurred is what underlies the United States' strong credit rating and um, credit rating agencies like Fitch have already weighed in that if we were to fail to pay um, any of our bills that that would call into question whether or not we deserve um, our, current, our current credit rating. And uh, it's simply a recipe for economic and financial catastrophe to think we can pay some of our bills and not all of them. Thank you. This debt prioritization sounds like another version of uh, Senator Scott's uh, privatization of Medicare and Social Security. It makes no sense to the country and to most of us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Th thank you. And I, I will just tell my colleague, in red counties in Oregon over the weekend, I went through this idea that we'd pay China and Wall Street first, and people were just stunned. So I think you made a very important point. Senator Bennett is next. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Madam Secretary. I wanted to ask you a couple questions I was, about the banking situation that we're facing today, but I, I just want to start, Mr. Chairman, because I've heard this discussion on the other side about the deficit. You know, I've been here for 14 years. The deficit and the debt hasn't gotten any better over that period of time. But I think it and, – and, and the good news is if we want to work together, we could actually close the gap because the gap isn't that, that gigantic compared to the way it's been in other places. If we could get it to a place where our, our government, our deficit wasn't growing faster than, uh, than our GDP, um, that – that would be a really good step forward. But I just want to point out that we need to recognize that we have this problem today, this gap, because of the Bush and Trump tax cuts. And the, de the, the deal that made 80 percent of the Bush tax cuts permanent, 80 percent of the Bush tax cuts permanent, a deal that I and Tom Carper were the only Democrats to vote against. There were three Republicans who voted against it. When you combine that and when you combine that with what we did with the Trump tax cuts, that's 2 percent plus 1 percent of GDP. That's 3 percent of GDP right there. So we would have closed that gap and been well on our way. So I'm not, you know, I, I know that I know that it's going to be a mix of spending cuts and it's going to be a mix of revenue, and that's how we get back to a place where, you know, you get a 19 percent of GDP of tax taxes and a 19 percent of GDP of spending. That's a felicitous place for us to be because, you know, maybe before we're dead, we actually will move beyond the political talking points and do something useful for our kids and our grandkids. But I just want the math to reflect that. And that's why I voted against that bill. That's why I think Tom Carper voted against that bill. And I said, you know, in my completely unnoticed campaign for president, on a debate stage with the pro – thank you. You're nice to say so. But with – I said with who – a person who became the President of the United States that that was a terrible deal that was struck between the, the Obama administration and the um, – and Mitch McConnell, frankly, to extend those tax cuts permanently. So until we get to a place where we're willing to actually – have a rational conversation about what it looks like, what every single state in the union I'm aware of, the conversation they have to have, because they have, you know, a duty and a responsibility to actually balance their budget. And I'm not even saying we have to balance it. Let's just get to a place where our debt is less than 3 percent of our GDP. We could make some progress. And there isn't a committee in Congress it's better situated than this committee to do it. That's not even what I wanted to talk to you about. I wanted to talk to you about the child tax credit, Madam Secretary, and all the evidence that we have that it worked, it did what it was supposed to do, uh, and that you guys did an amazing job of implementing it. And so I'm going to leave that question for the record as well. I just want to go to the banking issue that we have in front of us right now, Madam Secretary. Mar it's obvious to you and to me that marijuana – I'm going to get to the banking. But marijuana has been legal in Colorado for nine years. But legal cannabis businesses are frozen out of the financial system, the finances. Banks refuse to provide them financial services because of strict federal laws and regulations that prohibit them from offering services to cannabis businesses. Banking regulators can permanently ban someone from working in a bank or revoke an institution's FDIC coverage for working with cannabis businesses. This endangers the lives and livelihoods of Colorado business owners who have to pr operate uh, in, 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 in this kind of situation. They have nowhere to put their cash. Last weekend, Signature Bank failed. The other bank that failed, Silicon Valley Bank, you know, here's what they had to do to fail. They had to not observe the fact that their balance sheet had basically tripled over, you know, some period of time. Not observe the fact that they were in a in a, in, a, in a volatile, high-tech industry where the, the tide comes in and goes out for all those tech companies at exactly the same time, which is what we're seeing today, they had to make a decision to lay on 10-year paper with ridiculously high interest rates. And they weren't even that high, but compared to, I'm sorry, low interest rates compared to the interest rates that we were about to be challenged by the Fed. And I can tell you, 
unless somebody around here knows something, I don't know, Jay Powell wasn't exactly secretive about what he was doing with that. They had to get that through their board, they had to get that through that audit committee, and somehow they had to get that through a regulator, I guess, who was looking over that, who wasn't saying, this is insane what they were doing. We've had all week, it's been, is it Dodd-Frank, not Dodd-Frank, 2018, not 2018? I don't know what the answer is going to be about any of that, but I know that what they were doing was not prudentially sound, and I hope that the regulator would be the backstop. I'm 30 seconds over, so I will stop to go back to my mar marijuana question. Last weekend, Signature Bank failed, and almost a fifth of its deposits came from crypto. Like, they're not allowed to do anything with marijuana, but apparently they can lay 20% of this on, on crypto, a notoriously unstable, you know, a thing that nobody here even understands. And where the value of the assets can soar and collapse, we've seen that in this sector. And my question is, what questions come to your mind when you see that, when you've got a bank that's now failed, where 20 percent of, you know, what it was relying on to claim that it was doing the right thing by its depositors was something I would argue isn't even as stable as the marijuana industry in the state of Colorado, which can't get any approval from the Treasury Department. Well, as you pointed out, in the case of marijuana, it is against federal law, and that's a barrier, unfortunately, to um, appropriate banking services for the industry, and it's something the regulators have been looking for solutions to. I think we need to look into, um, the, the regulators do exactly what happened um, to create the problems that these two banks that failed faced and um, make sure that our regulatory system and supervision is appropriately geared so that banks manage their risks to avoid problems of the type that um, these banks have suffered from. Senator, Senator Bennett, thank you, and thank you for always being there to point out when numbers don't add up because that's exactly what the budget chairman, who's a member of this committee, Senator Whitehouse, just found a couple of days ago with respect to the House of Republicans. Senator Warner's next. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and Madam Secretary, it's great to see you. And uh, uh, let me commend my dear friend from Colorado. I've always noticed, Senator Bennett, what you do. And I think you raised uh, great issues. And I think about uh, one of the first gangs that you and Senator Crapo and I and others are on uh, Simpson Bowles wasn't perfect, but man, we'd be a heck of a lot further down the path if we had taken that. Um, let me also um, uh, mention I want to talk of something I think has not been raised on the on the banking issue, and I want to join a lot of my colleagues. I think um, you, the Fed, the FDIC move very aggressively. I think the potential downside risk for businesses across the country, for other medium-sized banks across the industry, could have been a disaster. And I think the actions you took were bold and stepped up and, and uh, uh, shored up the system. Um, and I'm <clears throat> of the belief that, uh, echoing what Senator Bennett said, that traditional prudential regulation should have caught this. Where was the bank management? Where was the regulators? both state and federal in the case of SVB, um, they didn't get this interest rate mismatch caught much, much earlier. But the one, the one thing, though, that I, I worry about, whatever regulatory system we had in place, um, the other half of what happened, that happened sometime between Tuesday and Thursday afternoon, where we've seen now the very first social media internet-based bank run. Um, to put this in any kind of comparison, you know, when Wa WAMU failed, the largest bank failure in our, our country's history, $16 billion coming out over a 10-day period. I'm not sure what regulatory system anywhere, no matter how much capital, no matter how many stress tests, that would have protected any institution from a $42 billion bank run in a single day. That literally at that point was 25 cents on the dollar of every dollar that was deposited. 
you know, I think we, most of us have all seen It's a Wonderful Life. Um, we realize that that money was off in small businesses and startup businesses around the country. Question I have is, who was playing the role of Mr. Potter? I think there were some, and I listen. I've got I've been supportive of the venture capital community. I was a venture capitalist before, but I think there were some bad actors in the VC community who literally started to spur this run by virtually cry, crying fire in a crowded theater in terms of rushing all of these deposits out. And I'm not sure that we have anything in our existing regulatory structure. Uh, and I don't, and, and it's early on, and we need to figure out what happened and who missed this. But this notion that, you know, 25 cents on every dollar can rush out in a single day, and people who spur this online Tuesday and Wednesday night bear no responsibility, and the hypocrisy of some who are who are libertarian until the stuff hits the fan, and then want relief is is is, is frankly a. Um, more than a little repugnant. So early on, this is not normally within the traditional uh, banking regulatory, but I, I think this will go down as the, the history's first internet-driven run. You have any initial thoughts on this? Well, you know, no matter how strong capital and liquidity supervision are, if a bank has an overwhelming run that's spurred by social media or whatever so that it's seeing deposits flee um, at that pace, um, a bank can be um, put at danger of failing. Of course, there's backup liquidity, there's the Fed's discount window, um, but this is really can be a threat to banks. And one of the reasons we um, intervened and declared a systemic risk exception is because of the recognition there can be contagion in situations like this, and other banks can then fall prey to the same kinds of runs, which we certainly want to avoid. But this was a bank that had a very high ratio of uninsured depositors. Um, insured depositors um, and retail customers um, are usually, usually do not run. We tend um, not to see runs among insured depositors, but um, the liquidity requirements um, and needs of a bank with such heavy reliance on uninsured deposits that are runnable, I think we need to think about that. And, and I, I agree, and, and you know, in, in a, a complete concentration in an industry sector but the the notion and I, again I don't I don't have a I don't have a solution in mind yet but the idea that uh, there is no responsibility for the equivalent of shouting fire in a crowded theater and forcing that run using technology as a mechanism to accelerate that you know presents a problem that I think I hope we could all kind of put our heads jointly together on thank you mr. chairman Th thank my colleague our next three would be Senator Thune Senator Lankford and Senator Cortez Masto. Senator Thune. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, thank you for being here. Madam Chairman, um, would you characterize the pandemic as being over? Well, I think we're still living with um, COVID. Its impact on um, America has diminished, but it still certainly exi exists yeah. and um, is, is uh, affecting affecting the economy? I think for, for um, all practical purposes, you know, most people acknowledge, yes, there's some overhang, but uh, that, that it is over. Um, and so just out of curiosity, how much of your workforce is back in the office? We're basically back to business as usual, um, although we um, have policies that enable a certain amount of work from home, as most, most companies um, and offices do. It's it's a practical and efficient way uh, to conduct business these days. There are some things that, that may be true, um, and this isn't your directly, your purview. Maybe it's a better question for the banking regulators, but I would be curious to know um, how much of their workforce is actually back in the office and functioning, because it seems to me that from a supervisory standpoint, if your job is to examine banks, 
that's something that you kind of have to be there to do. Um, and it seems to me, at least in your agency, as recently as when we were talking about the Inflation Reduction Act back in August, my understanding at that time was less than half back in the office. Um, if, that's, uh, if that's up, I'd like to know what the updated number is on that. Let me ask you, um, will you commit to, uh, to keeping this committee apprised of the Treasury's findings when it comes to SVB's, um, what you find there in a timely and thorough manner? Um, we, we certainly will keep this committee updated. However, um, much of the investigation um, of what happened at this bank would be done by the FDIC, and so that's, that's uh, an appropriate source of information. And we will, we will make sure we ask them that same question, but I, I know that you'll be involved. I mean, this obviously is something that you know, dramatically impacts the economy and would be uh, something uh, significantly of interest, I would think, the Treasury Department. Uh, I, and I'm hopeful you'll stick to that commitment. In a previous Finance Committee hearing, you gave your, quote, absolute word to keep us updated on Treasury's findings about the private taxpayer data that was improperly shared from the IRS to ProPublica. It's been almost two years since that breach of taxpayer data was made public. Administration still, still hasn't provided a meaningful response. Um, and you can answer that, but let me re go, move on here. I want to ask a question about the actions taken by the administration to shore up uh, Silicon Valley Bank and others, uh, Treasury issued a joint statement that stated, and I quote, no losses will be borne by the taxpayer. Do you stand by that statement? Yes. And I just want to stress this uh, is something that's deeply important to taxpayers, and I think it's something that I and I expect a lot of my colleagues, hopefully on both sides of the aisle, will be strictly holding this administration to account on. Um, you in, in the IRA got an additional $80 billion, six times the annual budget of the IRS through the, I should say, or not directly Treasury, but the IRS, and um, 87,000 new employees. Now, the request in this year's budget, because that's what we're talking about here today, is for an additional 15% increase, uh, somewhere on the order of 29 or $30 billion in additional. We still don't have the plan uh, for the $80 billion in IRS funding, and there was supposed to be a plan made public uh, several weeks ago. Um, so could you speak to uh, when we might see a plan, since there's a request now for additional funding above and beyond what was a massive, um, historic amount of funding in the IRA? So the plan is almost complete, and you should have it in the near future. And, um, and what does that mean, near future? in a matter of weeks. Okay. All right. I hope that uh, you, can, you can follow through on that. Um, and let me just ask, uh, with respect to uh, the use of that uh, $80 billion, some of it I know was supposed to be funded toward taxpayer services, which I hope is the case, because they're, they're, the, the IRS has had a deplorable record in getting back to taxpayers, 13% uh, fo phone call return rate. Uh, how much of that $80 billion is going to be directed to enforcement, and does the uh, Treasury expect that any of that revenue is going to come from increased audits of middle class taxpayers? The President um, and I have committed that uh, there will be no increase in audit rates on individuals or small businesses under $400,000, and I stand by that pledge, and I've issued a directive to IRS to that effect. Um, and most of the hiring, the large numbers that are seen, are replacement of uh, people who are retiring. But um, there will be additional hiring, both of customer service representatives. 5,000 more were hired this season, and the response rate has gone from the 13% you mentioned to around 85% this tax season, and we want to keep it at that level and add other things um, that will make filing and interacting with the IRS more convenient for both individuals and for businesses. Um, but an important goal is greater enforcement, hiring of skilled tax lawyers and, and auditors and accountants to deal with high, high income and high net worth individuals, complex partnerships, 
and um, corporations where we think most of the tax gap um, is centered. And so, um, although $80 billion over 10 years, it sounds like a huge investment. It's one with a, an enormous payoff that it substantially lowers the budget deficit because we have a huge tax gap the, the, that needs to be addressed. The time my friend's expired, we're going to push very hard to get every uh, finance member a chance to ask their questions before we go. Next will be Senator Lankford, Senator Cortez Masto. We've got the secretary till one. Senator Lankford. Thank you. Madam Secretary, thanks for being here. Uh, there's a lot of things that I wanted to be able to talk about on this. We've got some tax proposals on the table. I have a bipartisan uh, charitable act uh, dealing with tax policy uh, that we're not going to have time to be able to talk through. I'd like to be able to talk about full expensing. Uh, Senator Toomey used to be able to uh, champion this, but it's a big issue for our manufacturers in my state and all around the country. Love to get a chance to talk about that. I'd love to talk about marriage penalties in the tax code because, quite frankly, they're still there. It's one of the things we've got to be able to work on, energy independence. Uh, I did notice a whole new set of new taxes uh, on energy companies in the United States uh, that I think would hurt our energy independence. Uh, and there's still no definition for the $600. If you do Venmo uh, payments to somebody up to $600, now the IRS is going to track you. Uh, I've noticed that you've delayed that, and the IRS has delayed that. Uh, but there's a lot of questions with that and new creative definitions of what it means to be made in America. Uh, we now have new treaties that are popping up that are not really treaties, not really uh, free trade agreements, but are being declared free trade agreements to allow from the Inflation Reduction Act actions uh, from Japan and Germany to now be defined as made in America. I find that very creative. Love to talk about all that. Uh, don't have time. I'd need to be able to drill in on a couple of things. Let me start with some of the banking issues we're dealing with on it. Will the deposits in every community bank in Oklahoma, regardless of their size, be fully insured now? Are they fully recovered? Every bank, every community bank in Oklahoma, regardless of the size of the deposit, will they get the same treatment that SVBP just got or Signature Bank just got? A bank only gets that treatment if a majority of the FDIC board, a supermajority, a supermajority of the Fed board, and I, in consultation with the president, determine that the failure to protect uninsured depositors would create systemic risk and significant economic and financial consequences. So what is and your we plan? Made that determination. Right. Right. So, so what is your banks. plan to keep large depositors from moving their funds out of community banks into the big banks? We have seen the mergers of banks over the past decade. I'm concerned you're about to accelerate that by encouraging anyone who has a large deposit in a community bank to say, we're not going to make you whole, but if you go to one of our preferred banks, we will make you whole at that point. Um, look, I mean, we're, that's certainly not something that we're encouraging. That is happening right now. That is happening because depositors are concerned about the bank failures that have happened and whether or not other banks could also um, no, it, it, fail. No, it's happening and because it's, you're fully insured no matter what the amount is. If you're in a big bank, you're not fully insured if you're in a community bank. Well, you're not fully insured. And you, you big, were at signature, the, the and it, big, was, it just barely met that threshold. You were at signature. Well, we felt that there was a serious risk of contagion that could have brought down and triggered runs on many banks. Um, and that's something, given that our judgment is that the banking system overall is safe and sound, um, depositors should have confidence in the system, and we took these actions. So there's a special assessment that's been done on community banks in my state and all banks across the country. Was there any discussion that that special assessment would only apply to the larger banks, or was it always assumed the special assessment would cover every bank, including rural banks in my state? Um, I, I think I, I'm not certain what the rules are around that. Um, that that's uh, for the FDIC to determine. It, it, it has been reported publicly that uh, SVB 
had a large number of Chinese investors that are there, including some that were companies directly connected to the Chinese Communist Party. It, will, will, those will those individuals, companies, entities, and investors that are Chinese investors be made whole based on assessments in my banks in Oklahoma? So what I'm asking is, will my banks in Oklahoma pay a special assessment to be able to make Chinese investors whole from Silicon Valley Bank? Uninsured investors will be made whole in that bank, and I suppose that could include foreign and foreign depositors, but I don't believe there's any legal basis to discriminate among uninsured. I get it, but I, I'm just saying my community banks are going to pay this additional fee. It, it is always fascinating to me as well, the conversation that taxpayers are being made whole in this, that taxpayers are not going to have any kind of consequence on this. I'm sure my bankers are going to be very excited to know they no longer pay taxes. Uh, and their banks no longer pay taxes. Credit unions don't pay taxes, banks do. And so they're definitely taxpayers as well. And all yes. banks make their revenue off of rates and fees and such to their account holders, which means every Oklahoman will pay higher fees we're, if, in their community we're, we're, bank. We're just gonna we, have to have move on. If we have a collapse of the banking system and its economic consequences, that will have very severe effects I, on banks in Oklahoma I'm, that will also be threatened. I'm, I'm just worried about the long term. We are going to have to move on, or we're not going to have to move on, on on well. we're not gonna get all senators in. Senator Cortez Masta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Yellen, it's always good to see you. Thank you. Thank you let, before we get to the banking and the budget, let me ask you something that's um, important in my state, and I think across the country, quite honestly. These are the low income solar tax credits. Um, and uh, it, it is a question that I uh, asked um, Commissioner Werfel uh, regarding Section 13103 of the Inflation Reduction Act, which provides a bonus investment tax credit for certain renewable energy investments that were made in low-income communities. The February guidance that uh, Treasury puts out provides the potential applications uh, will only be considered for this tax credit during limited application windows. And uh, this limit, this is my concern, will, solar, uh, will limit solar deployment and the ability to drive clean energy investment in these communities because the investments with tax credits happens when you have certainty up front that the credit can be used. It's especially important because the law requires that the bonus credit that we put in the Inflation Reduction Act uh, be tied directly towards reductions in energy bills for consumers. So in light of these challenges and the headwinds facing the solar industry, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well, can you share um, uh, anything regarding the process for revising the guidance in, in this very near future to meet the intent of Congress, not only here with the solar tax credit, uh, to ensure that people can access it in a timely way before it goes away, but the guidance in general that you've talked about, because everybody's waiting for guidance to be implementing the Inflation Reduction Act uh, proposals we put in there and concern about they're gonna come too late before we can even utilize the opportunities. All I can say is that we are working 24 seven on the guidance and regulations that need to be written in order to implement the, um, the various tax credits that are in the IRA. We have no higher priority at Treasury, and um, we are really working tirelessly to get this done. My understanding is that we've committed to open the first phase of applications for this credit um, in the third quarter of this year, and we will provide detailed guidance ahead of accepting applications. So let me put a, a proposal out there, and, and uh, this is for some of my colleagues as well, because I think in general the Inflation Reduction Act and the work that we have been doing to lead us into this clean energy future requires a bridge to get us there. I'm sorry. Requires a bridge to get us there. And let me just say this. I support the manufacturing here in this country, and we need to build it and grow it. But when it comes to solar, we're not there yet. I support the manufacturing that is happening in Ohio and here across this country. But the manufacturing for the supplies that we need to grow out so solar in this country, 
uh, is only has a capacity of 5.6 gigawatts. Now, let me just say in 2022, we were able to actually install, the demand was for 20.2 gigawatts. So we are at a deficit there. And if we don't get these supplies, if we don't have what we need to address uh, bringing these supplies here from somewhere and, and deal with the tariffs that are out there that are limiting our access to these supplies, we are gonna be limited to the amount that we can grow our clean energy in this country through solar. So that's what I would love the administration to keep in mind, my colleagues as well, that yes, we want to make sure that we're getting our supplies from countries uh, that we support, that our friends, that are our partners, absolutely. But until we grow our domestic manufacturing here, we are not going to meet the demand for solar in this country that we need right now. And we're trying. Well, there is substantial incentives in this legislation to um, bring sol manufacturing of solar panels um, to the United States. And we're certainly picking up great interest among investors in um, moving manufacturing here. Um, we're trying to get out the regulations as rapidly as we possibly can to make sure that we provide the, the certainty that's needed for those investors. But there are big incentives in this um, package to, Thank you. to do just that. And we're excited to see what's Thank happening. You. And already. I don't mean to cut you off. I only have so much time. Let me just talk about the budget real quick, uh, what I see here. I is it true that um, the federal deficit has been reduced by over $1.7 just in the last two years? Yes, that is true. And it's also true what you said earlier, that this budget proposed by this administration looks at also an additional deficit reduction of $3. trillion years over 10 years. That is correct. So this administration is concerned about reducing the deficit, correct? Yes. And the debt limit that we're talking about, everybody's talking about that debt limit, let's be fair, let's talk in a bipartisan way, that that debt was incurred by both previous Republican and Democratic administrations, correct? Yes, when we're talking about paying bills that um, for uh, spending and that Congress is authorized. I appreciate that. Thank you. I know I'm over my time. I will submit the rest of my questions for the record. Thank you, Secretary. I, I thank, thank my colleague, and I will just say during the 10-year odyssey, of developing those clean energy tax credits. It was always our intent to have the bonus solar tax credit for low-income communities. So we'll continue to work with my colleague. Thank Senator you. Warren. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So on Friday, the United States faced the second biggest bank failure in our entire history. And as panic spread among small businesses and nonprofits that had money deposited with Silicon Valley Bank, Treasury and other financial regulators announced they would take emergency measures to stabilize the system. I'm grateful for the administration's steady hand, but we shouldn't have had to be here in the first place. These bank failures were the direct result of policymakers' decisions over the last five years, beginning with a 2018 law signed by President Trump with the support of both parties to weaken the regulations that had been put in place after the 2008 financial crisis to ensure that big banks never again crashed our economy. On Monday, President Biden called on Congress and regulators to, quote, strengthen the rules for banks to make it less likely that this kind of bank failure will happen again, end quote. Secretary Yellen, thank you for being here today. Do you agree with the president that we need to strengthen our banking rules? Well, I think we certainly need to analyze carefully what happened that triggered these bank failures and re-examine our rules and supervision and make sure that they're appropriate to address the risk that banks face. Okay, so we wanna make sure we've got the right rules in place. Um, and pretty obvious, we need some stronger rules here, so I wanna talk about those rules, the stress okay. test. Stress tests are critical tools in the regulatory toolbox that are designed to expose banks' vulnerabilities if bad things happen and force the banks to shore up any weak points before it's too late. Now, Secretary Yellen, when you were implementing the Dodd-Frank regulations as Fed chair six years ago, back in 2017, you said, quote, our stress testing regime is forcing banks 
to greatly improve their risk management and capital planning, end quote. But you warned that because, quote, we can never be confident that there won't be another financial crisis, it is important that we maintain the improvements that have been put in place that mitigate the risk and the potential damage, end quote. So I want to talk about those stress tests that you talked about, how important they were six years ago. Secretary Yellen, can regular, rigorous, well-designed stress tests help bank regulators spot problems lurking in banks' balance sheets and business models? Yes. I continue to endorse the comments Good. That you quoted. I think this has been one of the most important and consequential improvements in supervision since the financial okay. crisis. So, but two with, thumbs up for stress tests. Let me just ask, when regulators spot these problems early on, can those regulators then require the banks to clean up the problems long before they trigger a run on the bank? Yes, and in that sense, they're useful, but I would like to make one point, sure. which is that the supervisory stress tests focus on capital yes. and not on liquidity. And in these bank failures, um, liquidity played an important so, role. So let's, well, let's ask the question then all the way around. If stress tests are done right, if we have robust stress tests, the way you described six years ago when you were still running the Fed, do they just test one thing that might go wrong or do they test for lots of different problems if they're done right? If they're done right, they test for many possible problems, but they do not focus on liquidity. Okay, but they, they test for many capital. kinds of things that go wrong. Is that right? Potentially. Yes, there are different scenarios every year and um, so let me ask you then a, a related question is one of the problems that stress tests can expose is that you have managers who are not very good at managing risk or management that is otherwise doing a bad job that could put a bank in jeopardy well that's the purpose of supervision and um, supervision uh, stress tests are one tool supervision but is another tool that's um, critical. Okay, so very important. Things. We've got stress tests, we've got supervision, we've got a lot of pieces here to make this work. In 2018, though, Trump's bank deregulation law and the door it opened for Fed Chair Powell to further hack away at the rules created an exception to annual Fed-administered stress tests letting banks from $50 billion to $250 billion effectively off the hook. And that meant that a bank like SVB, which had $209 billion in assets when it failed, would be exempt from annual stress testing. So the question I have here is if the law had not, uh, it, let's not just do stress tests. It's stress test, it's the whole package. Enhanced liquidity requirements that ensure that banks have enough cash on hand to meet their obligations, particularly in times of stress, capital requirements that better position banks to absorb losses, regular resolution plans to help guide regulators safely through winding down failed banks, all of these were weakened in 2018 and when SVB failed. Uh, this is a part, in my view, of the Fed's actions that led to weaker regulation. You know, over the last few days, we've heard a lot of Republicans say that this collapse wasn't their fault. It was the banking regulators who were asleep at the wheel. And believe me, I have questions for a lot of the banking regulators. But Congress handed Chair Powell the flamethrower that he aimed at the banking rules. In fact, he said so himself, I'll quote and then I'll quit. When he announced that he was weakening regulations for the banks like SBV, Chair Powell said, and I quote, in the rules before us, we are applying the discretion granted to us by the Economic Growth Regulatory Relief and Consumer Protection Act. Translation, 
Congress opened the door to weaker, weaker regulations, and I'm waltzing right through it. That's true. Congress I, needs to I, close that door. I, I I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. My, my colleague has great experience in this, and I apologize for having to cut people off. Senator Johnson's next. Did you call on me? I was, okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, uh, Secretary Yellen. Uh, I just want to start. Do, do you know how much a dollar that you held at the start of the Biden administration in January 2021 is worth today? Well, we've had inflation and it's declined in its purchasing it's, it's, power. It's worth 87 cents. In your testimony, you said that inflation is the number one economic problem. Uh, do you know what the inflation rate was at the start of the Biden administration in January 2021? It was substantially low. It was 1.4 percent. Uh, you said that inflation has many causes. I, I agree with that. By the way, I, I would say that the number one economic problem is our debt and deficit. And I would say that the top three causes of inflation are massive deficit spending, uh, the war on fossil fuels, which have driven energy, gasoline prices to record levels, uh, obviously supply chain dislocation. That was caused by our miserably failed and it, 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 in st incredibly stupid response to COVID, the pandemic. But would you agree those are the top three causes of inflation? Uh, deficit spending, high energy costs, and supply dislocations? I don't believe that deficit spending is one of the main causes you, you of inflation. You don't? I mean, inflation is too many dollars chasing too few goods. Well, so when, you, when you're printing all this stuff, so do you know in the first three fiscal years of the Biden administration, you know how much the total deficit spending is going to be? We had um, an economic collapse that was caused by right, the pandemic. Right, and we were certainly coming out of that because there's all this pent up demand and a sloshing around of trillions of dollars. So I'll answer that question for you too. The first three fiscal years of this administration, the total deficits would be about $5.7 trillion. So now, so now you're, you're, you're here testifying before the, about the uh, president's budget. How much are the total deficits over that 10 year period according to the president's budget? You don't know that off the top of your head? Um. Yeah, looks like I'm running out. It's seventeen trillion dollars. Okay. Yeah, that's. Uh, you're going to drive the debt from somewhere around thirty-two trillion up to about fifty trillion dollars, correct? Yes, but what what I believe is the single most import, important metric for judging the fiscal stance of the country is real net interest as a share of GDP. Okay. We have so, so are you concerned when, you, when you're taking the debt from 32 to $50 trillion, are you concerned who's going to buy that debt? And also at what rate they'll expect to be compensated for buying riskier and riskier debt? Are you concerned about that? Well, if the net interest, real net interest cost of the debt remains low relative to GDP and we're on a sustainable Fiscal well, we're, we're not. Course. We're not. We're not on a well, sustainable I, path. Are you, I, you know, I Senator, Senator Cassie was Senator Cassie was talking about the president's uh, demagoguery on Social Security, unwillingness to meet to try and save Social Security. Uh, if we do nothing and the Social Security trust fund runs out 2023 to 2025, about the end of the budget period, are you concerned about? Are we going to have the financial wherewithal to plus up benefits to honor those promises? I mean, you, you think we're going with 50 trillion dollars in debt? You know, debt succeeding uh, our GDP. Are, aren't you concerned about our inability to honor those promises? The interest cost on the debt as a share of our economy remains quite low throughout the 10-year horizon of the president's budget. It remains yeah, around one percent. Secretary, you, you were also the one who said very that manageable. You, you also said the set, that inflation was transitory. And it certainly isn't, and I think Chairman Powell certainly now agrees the fact that, no, we've got something going on here that's going to take a very long while, unfortunately, to wring out of our system. Uh, not only you, but uh, Director, OMB Director Young and members of the other side keep talking about uh, that you're cutting deficits. Uh, the deficit in 2021 obviously was high because of the pandemic, but in 2022 it was about $1.4 trillion. 2023, we think it's going to be about 1.6 trillion. 2024, your 
uh, projecting 1.85 trillion, and again, growing debt by another seven, it never drops below 1.5 trillion dollars. How can you how can you claim that you're cutting deficits? Well, it always is a comparison with the baseline of what would happen if our policies I mean, you're, were you're not really enacted, and the increase in deficits would be larger. Um, there's net re deficit but, but reduction say, saying, over Saying you're cutting the deficits is just misleading the American public. Let me ask you one, one final that. question. Uh, because we always hear on the other side, same thing from OMB Director Young yesterday, that we want to make the rich pay their fair share. So, I mean, the fact is, and this is the latest figures we have from the Treasury, 2020, the top 1% made about 22% of income, but they paid 42.3% of the income tax. Now, at, at, I just, I'm not going to ask you the metric. At what point... I mean, how much of the total income tax should the top 1% pay before you'll consider and before President Biden will consider they're finally paying their fair share? I mean, they're paying double the income tax that they're being, getting an in income. It's obviously a highly progressive rate. By the way, the bottom... My, my, they're paying my about colleagues a, over his time, and I want the, okay. uh, the witness to answer his question. Well, I, I believe that billionaires should pay um, rates that are... Um, not lower than what a teacher or firefighter pay, okay, pays. Okay, the top 1% averages... That's the time I'm of the sorry, gentleman's expired. The Senator, Senator, well, Senator Tillis my, is My next. colleague got seven minutes. The, the top 1% pay... The effect, time of the gentleman's expired. The bottom 50% pay 3.1. We have a highly progressive tax system. Senator Tillis, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Madam Secretary, just, just real, real quick on this question. The President's budget, I think, assumes 4.3% of inflation through calendar year 2023. Number one, can you confirm that or give me a, a, an accurate number if I'm wrong? And then just describe for me how do we do that, uh, particularly in light of what's happened with SVB and what I think we will continue to see monetary policy that's going to increase. Uh, incrementally until we get inflation under control. That creates other stressors for the banking community. But is it 4.3 percent, and do you, you agree with that assumption? Did you say inflation? Yeah, inflation. For, for calendar 2023. year 2023. We assumed that inflation would run at 3 percent. At 3 percent. And, and we're in the, uh, the tail end of March. Um, so you still believe, given the inflation estimates we got, that that's still a valid assumption? It is coming down on a 12-month basis, and... Yeah, okay. Um, if, if we could just get to the committee, the, uh, the analysis that went into that, I think it'd be helpful. Um, I, I want to go back to uh, Senator Warren's question or comments very quickly. Back in 2017, I think you were quoted before the, G, uh, the uh, Joint Economic Committee with respect to Senate Bill 2155 that the Fed would still be able to impose enhanced prudential standards on firms if necessary, and that the bill is a move in the right direction that would be a good enabling for the Fed to appropriately tailor its supervision. Do you still stand by that statement? I, I think that tailor, I, yeah. I didn't, I, I said that I thought tailoring, okay. tailoring is appropriate, and I still believe that, and okay. I think the Fed Thank you. Um, continues to have. I guess the question that I have, because I don't, I don't agree with uh, Senator Warren's the, the premise of her questions. It seems to me, unless we, oh, and I should say that in that same time frame, uh, Mr. Torello was responsible for implementing a bill that he publicly criticized, Senate Bill 2155. He he did not like the bill. Um, he's over there helping implement it. And yesterday, when wasn't. Wasn't it passed in 2018? He, le he left. That, no, no, no. I'm sorry. When you were implementing Dodd Frank, I'm sorry. sorry. So when you were implementing Dodd Frank, Torillo was in play. Then we passed Senate Bill 2155. He was highly critical of it. However, he said as late as yesterday, he doesn't believe that Senate Bill 2155 had anything to do with what occurred at Silicon Valley Bank, um, and that his suspicion was that it was supervisory. Uh, uh, maybe supervisors not being aggressive and potentially using some of the discretionary regulatory regimens that were allowed in Senate Bill 2155 if you happen to have a specific bank that had activities where you should increase, um, increase the level of supervision. Um, so it seems to me 
that here we're using 2155 as a red herring for something that I believe fundamentally is going to be a supervisory or regulatory lapse. I want to ask you a question about OECD in my time remaining, and I do want to get close to five minutes. Um, the baseline agreement doesn't have what I consider to be the most basic standards for dispute resolution, um, but it looks as if we still want to move forward with congressional action absent that. Um, I also have some concerns with uh, the exemptions that uh, are in uh, the agreement, particularly with respect to China. And I'm grossly uh, summarizing my context to give you a chance to, uh, to respond. But let me tell you, even beyond the exceptions uh, that benefits China and uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, this committee nor the Committee on Taxation has received the data and, and analysis that you all used as a basis for negotiating the deal. Can I just simply get a commitment that the Joint Committee on Taxation and that this committee will get that data and analysis as a part of our future consideration uh, for the provision that has to come before Congress? I'm sorry, I'm not sure if you're talking about Pillar 2 or Pillar one. Um, I think it's all of the above to the extent that well, they're both in the agreement. Well, I think the analysis on pillar two has been done. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the Joint Committee on Taxation has looked at that and we've, we've provided estimates as well that are used standard methods and can discuss we'll submit that a, with you. Uh, we'll, Pillar one. We'll submit a question had, for the record. My time has expired. We'll submit a question for the record I, uh, to fully describe exactly what we're looking for. And to the extent that it's possessed by some members, then I'll stipulate that I was wrong. But I'm going in with a little bit of a skeptical uh, position. Thank you. I, I thank my colleague for his courtesy. And we'll have the staff, the finance staff, share what we have on Pillar one and Pillar two with my colleague. Senator Blackburn is next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, thank you for being with us today. I want to return to the SVB issue and ask you, I haven't heard you say today, when were you first notified that there were problems with SVB and when did you alert members of Congress? What was that time lag? Um, I believe that I first found out about the troubles at Silicon Valley Bank um, I guess it was last Thursday. Last Thursday. And then your notification of Congress came when? Um, we, the, the bank was put Why in... Why don't you just put that in writing for me so I don't uh, waste my time. I know Senator Langford asked you about the deposit insurance fund and how that would affect our local banks. And there's a lot of concern over this. And I know you were uncertain about that. If you would run the numbers on that and let us know a ballpark of what you think this would cost if you end up insuring everybody's deposit. And then I have to ask you, being from Tennessee, you know, we have a long and storied history of opposing nationalizing the banking system. Do you see this as a step to nationalize the banking system? A absolutely not. I see okay. this as a step toward stemming contagion that could come okay. from the failure of these banks that would place um, community banks okay. across the country at Thank great you. risk of runs as All well right. that we want to... Um, Thank you, ma'am. Let me move to the Inflation Reduction Act and that implementation. I hear a lot about this from local mayors and our state agencies. There is a lot of money that can be doled out. Treasury and other agencies are going to be required to issue guidance. That hasn't come. And so there's a lot of confusion there. And I was looking at the structure, and I want to make certain that I'm viewing this right. You have you, 
the Deputy Secretary, the Office of IRA Implementation within Treasury, the Office of IRA Implementation in the IRS, and Danny Werfel, who is the new recently confirmed IRS Commissioner. So with all of these bodies involved, who is actually in charge? Who's the final decision maker on the guidance and the timeline for releasing that guidance? Well, our Office of Tax Policy drafts regulations, okay, so and we go it. through a regular rulemaking. Then do you rulemaking. sign off on it? Are you I, the final I do. say? I so do you sign are off the one on it. We confer say. with many, okay. many uh, people then, in the process of drafting that, and it will go through full comment and review before right. final. Let me ask you something else, because the buck stops with you. Uh, you have um, really praised the IRA. I want to ask you one more thing about that, because your statements contradict themselves somewhat. You talk about the IRA as a way to really um, bring prosperity, to lower inflation, to lower the debt. So do you really believe that we can spend our way to lower inflation, to debt reduction, and to economic prosperity with well, the I, I of debt. I, I believe that this law um, promotes clean energy uh, and R&D and investment but in the United States. That's not my States. question. It Do will... you believe we can spend our way to lower inflation? And I'm going to move on, obviously. I've never said any there. such. Oh, okay. I've never said that I think that All that's right. a Thank way you, to lower inflation. Uh, you have mentioned the IRS help uh, being able to answer more phone calls and respond more uh, quickly because of the IRA funding. And I was looking at the IRS data, and it shows that the IRS actually answered 2.6 million fewer calls this March. Uh, during the tax filing system uh, season. So, and I know Senator Thune asked you about this. If we could get some clarity uh, from you and from your testimony um, about this and how many, what there, is the rate? Uh, how often are these calls answered and missed? What percentage of people at the IRS are still working remotely and what is your timeline? for bringing them all back? I, what I can tell you is that the response rate to customer calls has been between 80 and 90% every week during this tax oh, filing okay. season, and that's a massive improvement. The, uh, the IRS hired 5,000 new people to put into customer service, and um, that relied on funds from my, the IRA. My time has expired, but the Eight Corners data call that the IRS gave in early March, the IRS says they've actually answered 2.6 million fewer calls well, there this may, tax filing season. There may have been fewer calls, but the rate of response was very much higher. Well, thank you. Thank higher. you, Madam Secretary. We do need to move on. Senator Menendez. Uh, the Federal Reserve's emergency lending facility is predicated upon the notion that Treasury and agency securities have no credit risk. That facility will be expending, extending loans of up to a year using these securities as collateral. But one problem, potential problem, is that unless Congress raises the debt ceiling in the next few months, U.S. Treasury and agency securities will face the prospect of default. Now, while I certainly won't vote to default on the debt, I think some of my colleagues may not feel the same way. In light of the events in the financial system over the past week, how damaging would a debt default be to our banking sector, particularly to regional banks? It, it would be completely devastating. And I don't think that Congress should, for a second, contemplate the possibility of not raising the debt ceiling to pay our bills. This is the cornerstone of um, what, what makes our uh, financial markets the soundest and best in the world, and people uh, trust that the government stands ready to pay its bills. 
it and would be a And obviously, if we're using Treasury securities to back up the loans that we're making, if those Treasury securities default, then we have a, a, a cascading effect. It, it's beyond contemplation. Right. Is it possible, uh, I should say, isn't it possible that if Congress fails to raise the debt ceiling well before any default, that we could run the risk of seeing more runs on regional banks? Yes, we, well, we have seen that concern about con whether Congress would meet this responsibility has provoked um, concern in financial markets. That was evident, for example, in 2011 mm -hmm. when there was a downgrading of the U.S. credit rating because of doubts as to whether or not Congress would act appropriately. Well, the fact is that a debt ceiling fight has always been dangerous. It's Always. dangerous for our financial system. Agreed. It's dangerous for our businesses. Yes. It's dangerous for working families. And it's dangerous to put at risk the U.S. dollar as the reserve of choice in the world, which others are seeking to replace us in, uh, which has enormous benefits to us. Wouldn't you say that having I, our dollar as the reserve choice in the world? Yes, I completely agree. It's no. because, in part, because our financial system is so deep and treasuries are regarded as so safe and liquid. Now, in 2018, Congress passed a bill which was signed to law by President Trump that relaxed regulation for institutions like Silicon Valley Bank. That law, which I opposed, exempted those banks from enhanced prudential standards, stress tests, raising the threshold at which a bank would be considered systemically important. So even as the law kept Silicon Valley Bank off the list of systemically important institutions, regulators on a bipartisan basis, rightly cited systemic risk to justify their actions over the weekend. So, Secretary Yellen, isn't it true that the situation at Silicon Valley Bank posed systemic risk? Well, look, I think it's, it's important for um, regulators, the banking supervisors, to examine what happened at this bank. But clearly, the bank had a very high proportion of uninsured deposits, which um, made it vulnerable to runs and it experienced but if the, devastating if, runs. But, Madam Secretary, the regulators said that the reason they're intervening because there was systemic risk, then it must have been systemic risk, right? Well, in the sense that the, the chances of contagion that other banks might be regarded as unsound and suffer runs um, seemed seemed extremely high, and the consequences would be very serious. Seems to me that uh, institutions, while we still have a lot to learn, like Silicon Valley Bank, have the potential to be systemically important, and our laws and regulations should treat them as such. Let me close on the following. In the President's budget proposal, there is yet a glaring absence of a issue critical to families in my state and in other states in the country. The budget continues to allow C corporations to fully deduct state and local taxes as under current law. Isn't that the, the, the case? I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure. I, th I think so, but. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, for the purposes of our discussion, let me just assure you that the budget allows C corporations to fully deduct state and local taxes under current law. Okay. But it does not propose the same tax benefit for middle class families. Um, is, is that fair to say? The issue of state and local taxes is one we think that Congress should address. Well, I'll close by saying if C corporations can deduct state and local taxes, middle class families should be able to deduct state and local taxes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Secretary Yellen. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you also for the conversation that we had on Monday. We may not always see eye to eye on a number of the issues, but your availability was helpful and understanding and appreciating the actions of the administration. Um, so thank you for that part. Thank you, Senator. I'm sure you've seen and maybe even had a big hand in proposing some of the President's budget requests. I can honestly spend hours talking about the President's budget and how much I dislike it. Uh, I think it's bad for the economy. I think it's bad for the American people. We certainly see $5 trillion of tax increases, $7 trillion of spending the highest rate of taxes on individuals in the last 40 years, and a new corporate tax rate higher than the tax rate imposed on 
Chinese Communist Party on their own businesses. More and more policies that undermine our own nation's energy independence and energy security. This isn't a budget that unifies the country. This budget only seeks to isolate and divide us. This budget simply said, tax is too much and spends too much. In the midst of all this budget talk, however, we are once again having to exercise important oversight over the federal regulators and agencies responsible for ensuring they're doing the job that Congress gave them the tools to do. As such, I want to spend some time discussing Silicon Valley Bank. While there are many questions that might be, that must be answered, I do know a few things for sure. First, the bank failure failed because of its management and because of its board. I know that the failure of SVB also was contributed to by a lax regulatory environment. I believe that the state and federal regulators failed to appropriately use the tools they have to supervise and regulate the failed institutions. And finally, that the Biden's handling of the economy contributed to these bank failures. The President's budget is further evidence of reckless tax and spending that will only exacerbate the highest inflation we've seen in 40 years. This impact will be felt by everyone and everything from grocery bills to financial institutions. It appears that the San Francisco Fed was asleep at the wheel. They failed to meet their basic, not enhanced, but basic supervisory responsibilities and therefore missed their opportunity to use enhanced supervisory tools if necessary. Instead of taking accountability for this blatant failure, regulators are now forecasting that they plan to increase regulations on the rest of the banking industry. In other words, the banks that made responsible business decisions and have not failed. The failure to supervise is inexcusable and I plan to hold the regulators accountable. This administration's tax and spend reckless policies fueled inflation and will only further lead to unmanageable inflation and higher and higher interest rates. Secretary Yellen, will this administration acknowledge that their reckless tax and spending contributed to not only the challenges that we see in everyday households, but also to the challenges that we're facing today with SVB? Look, inflation is too high and it is the president's top priority to bring it down. And there are many contributors to why inflation is too high. Importantly, fallout from the pandemic and Russia's war on Ukraine that boosted food and energy prices. Many countries around the world suffer from the same problem, regardless of what their fiscal policy was. Thank you. I don't want to cut you off, but, but I only have a minute left. And I want to just, with my synopsis, there's no doubt that the pandemic was in the rearview mirror. We saw the COVID relief response in January of 21 that spent $1.9 trillion. The only thing missing in that COVID relief bill was COVID relief, which we had 1% for COVID vaccines, under 10% for COVID-related health, but we had a lot of liberal policies embedded in the $2 trillion of spending, which then led and accelerated inflation to a 9.1% or a 40-year high. The Fed response to the high level of inflation was to have eight rate increases leading to a liquidity challenge that we are now seeing uh, the results of. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Hassan. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Crapo, and uh, for holding this hearing today. A uh, thank you to you and the chair. And Secretary Yellen, thank you so much for being here and for testifying before the committee. Um, I would like to follow up uh, on issues that my colleagues asked about. Uh, concerning the recent actions that the administration has taken to protect our economy. Last weekend, the Treasury and other agencies took several steps to strengthen public confidence following the failure of two banks. The priority of federal regulators needs to continue to be protecting families and small businesses by ensuring the stability of our banking system and our economy more broadly. 
Given the events of the past week, I'd like to understand how Treasury is evaluating the effectiveness of its recent actions. So what specific benchmarks are you using to measure the success of Treasury's actions? For example, what are the economic indicators that you are actively monitoring? Well, we are looking at indicators of the functioning and stress in the banking system. Um, we want to make sure, make sure that um, the problems at these two banks don't spread to others, and so we're monitoring very carefully um, the situation of banks in the United States using a wide range of indicators. And a more general problem that um, concerns us is the possibility that if banks are under stress, they might um, be reluctant to lend where they're worried about shoring up liquidity and capital. Uh, and we could see uh, ex credit become more expensive and less available. And there are a variety of statistics that we can look at to judge whether or not banks are tightening credit, things like the uh, senior loan officers um, survey of credit terms and related statistics on the cost of borrowing, because that could turn this into um, a source of significant downside economic risk. Well, I appreciate that. I think being really clear about what the goals are and having transparency about defining success is critical here. Uh, and I just want to urge you and the administration to continue communicating with Congress as it closely monitors the situation to ensure that we have a coordinated and responsible and effective response to the entire situation. Um, I want to turn now to tax issues that are overseen by Treasury. Last year, my bipartisan Home Energy Savings Act, something I introduced with Senator Collins, was signed into law. This bill expanded tax cuts for homeowners who make energy efficiency upgrades, such as installing a more efficient HVAC system in their homes, which also obviously lowers energy bills. How is the Treasury increasing awareness of these tax cuts for homeowners, given the high energy and other costs that families are facing? Well, as you point out, there are really critical supports here for taxpayers. They can get um, up to $2,000 for upgrades like uh, heat pumps, 30% uh, on the cost of installing solar panels and so forth. We have worked with IRS to publish plain language, frequently asked questions on all of these credits, and you can find this on the IRS's IRA uh, homepage. There, there are also other sites, something called cleanenergy.gov, but really we want to get the word out broadly, and we would be um, eager to work with you to discuss ways that we make sure homeowners know what they're eligible for. Well, I would look forward to continuing to work on that. Obviously, with high energy costs being what they are, uh, especially in the Northeast, it's really, really of important course. that we get the word out. Um, last question here. Along with Senator Brown, I'm leading the effort to cut red tape for online sellers by reducing the number of casual online sellers who receive unnecessary and confusing 1099 tax forms. It's important that we work across the aisle to find a bipartisan way to cut down on these unnecessary necessary forms. As Congress considers various ways to address this challenge in a bipartisan way, will Treasury provide analysis of the impact of different proposals on online sellers? Certainly, we'll try to work with you on that. You know, we were trying to implement a provision of the uh, rescue plan that uh, required reporting of transactions over $600. Right. Um, it's set to take effect this year. But we realized that um, there were concerns, broad concerns, about that timeline. And so we have delayed. Um, and we'll certainly, we want to reduce confusion. And we'll work with you to try to do that. Well, I appreciate that very much. And I, I see that I'm over time. I will just note that there are a number of us in Congress who want to do more than delay it. We want to correct what we think uh, is a bad policy we and would, we pro would provides lots Congress. of confusion. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank my colleagues. Senator Young is next. 
Welcome, Madam Secretary. It's good to have you here before the committee. I, I want to take a moment uh, to begin to join my Republican colleagues in expressing uh, my frustration and uh, displeasure over the way the administration's handled the OECD Pillar 2 negotiations. Um, to that end, uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that uh, a cop copy of my longer statement on this topic. Without objection to order. Thank you. So to summarize this statement, my concern is whether enacting the regime globally would undermine the incentive to invest in the United States and to grow jobs here in the United States. Uh, I fear the answer to that question is yes. In particular, the Pillar 2 untaxed, uh, undertaxed profits rule would uniquely disadvantage American workers and job creating businesses by providing our trading partners with the political blessing to tax the U.S. activity of U.S. companies. That's right, let me repeat that. Foreign countries under the undertaxed profits rule, with these negotiations, could tax the U.S. activity of U.S. companies. This would, of course, directly undercut our American sovereignty, but it would also impact the legislative power of, of tax writers to provide bipartisan, well-crafted, thoughtful economic incentives, like the research and development tax provisions important to uh, our, our dynamic economy. This credit which my bipartisan colleagues and, and I are fighting so hard to protect, and much more, look to be wiped out under Pillar 2. So, Madam Secretary, American workers and, and American companies deserve a, a better deal. And uh, I want to begin by asking you to go back to the negotiating table and, and negotiating that deal for them. Uh, moving on, uh, Madam Secretary, as you know, the, uh, President Biden has promised dozens of times that he won't raise taxes on anyone earning less than $400,000 a year. During the budget reconciliation exercise in August of last year, that was our second budget reconciliation, you'll recall, I introduced the not one penny in taxes raised amendment to allow the American people to hold members of Congress who agreed with that pledge, and to hold the president accountable. That amendment passed the United States Senate by a vote of 98 to 1. 49 out of 50 of my Democratic colleagues agreed with Republicans. We can't raise taxes when Americans are struggling. Mr. Chairman, I ask uh, unanimous consent that a copy of, of uh, my amendment and the roll call votes be uh, entered into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Secretary Yellen, in, in the view of the administration, which tax rates or other provisions from the Tax Cuts and, and Jobs Act that are scheduled to sunset after 2025 must be extended in order not to violate President Biden's pledge that no taxes will in, be increased on anyone earning less than $400,000? For the benefit of all members, in understanding these important red lines for the President of the United States, please include all provisions that you understand would cause the President's pledge to be violated if they are not extended. Well, there certainly are aspects of TCJA that, um, if they sunset, would impact households um, or taxpayers earning under $400,000. And the President has, as you mentioned, pledged he doesn't want to see taxes raised by a penny on anyone making under that. That's and right. So he stands ready to work with Congress. Well, no, no, the president made the pledge, and, and so I want to know the administration's position on this. I know my Democratic colleagues will want to know it as well. My time is short, so can you please provide the specific TCJA provisions that have to be extended? in order to keep President Biden's tax promise? I, I don't know that I can provide you with that. I think 
there are a lot of complicated provisions and exactly what happens to different taxpayers. That is reasonable. Will depend on You're a reasonable a person. I'm known as a reasonable person, one right now that's two seconds over time. So I just ask you, Madam Secretary, could, could you commit to providing me and other members of this committee with that comprehensive list within two weeks from today? It shouldn't be difficult. You have an army of people supporting you. I, I think it is a very complex exercise, and um, I'm not sure that Is it that complex is to keep the pledge? The, the time of the gentleman's expired. I want to work with the gentleman with respect to the updates on the tax law. It's well known that on our side we opposed it, and your side you did. The gentleman wants to know how we're going to proceed, and the secretary said it's complicated. I'm going to work with my colleague. Well, let's let's work our way through the complications so we can all keep our, our pledges not to th – this cannot be violated. I've, I've told my constituents it, it will not be, so. And we agree with that and would like to work with All right. Better. I'll look forward to that list. Yeah. Thank you. Senator Daines is next. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Secretary Yellen, thanks for being here today. Thank you. Secretary Yellen, the president's budget included $4.7 trillion with a T in total tax hikes, including $1.8 trillion in new taxes on Main Street businesses. The president's budget also includes a shadow tax increase on small businesses in Montana and across the country by remaining absolutely silent on the future of the 20% pass-through business tax deduction. We must remind ourselves that 95% of the businesses in the United States of America are pass-throughs, they're not c -Cors. And yet this budget was silent on a 20% tax increase coming for many small businesses in the course of, uh, of 2026. I'm planning to reintroduce my Main Street Tax Certainty Act in the coming weeks, which would protect these businesses from this shadow tax hike by making this important deduction permanent. With the President's pledge in mind, will you commit to making the 199A deduction permanent? I mean, all I can really say is that the President has pledged not to raise taxes on individuals or small businesses making under $400,000, but um, no promises with respect beyond, beyond that. Okay, I'll, I'll take that as a no um, and move on to my next question. Uh, Senator Young raised this issue of uh, Pillar 2 of the OECD proposal, which you spearheaded and have championed. It's littered with these complex rules that would benefit state-owned enterprises at the expense of capitalist competitors. Why are you a proponent for a framework that will allow China to tax American companies? And I, I understand this. I was involved in global operations for most of my 20-year career in the private sector. Tax companies on their American operations if they fall below the minimum tax threshold, even if they fall below the threshold by utilizing the bipartisan tax incentives such as the R&D tax credit. So um, the agreement does permit it includes an under tax payments rule um, by which other countries can exercise their rights to impose taxes on, op on operations of foreign countries. Um, which would include China. That, that don't abide by the 15% tax. Mm -hmm. um, the United States can impose a top up tax uh, to ensure that those those revenues end up in the U.S. Uh, Treasury instead of in a foreign country. I move on to child tax credits. Uh, as you know, Secretary Yellen, the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act doubled the tax, child tax credit from $1,000 to $2,000 and increased refundability threshold to $1,400. I was certainly disappointed at the time that all of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle opposed this change and made it impossible to make it permanent, but I am glad that we enacted as Republicans into law. The President's budget proposes increasing the child tax credit from the current $2,000 to $3,600. It makes it fully refundable and delivered on a monthly basis. However, I see they didn't make that change permanent. It expires in 25. 
even though there's no limitations in a presidential budget to do so. My question be this, does the president believe that the child tax credit should be made permanent for $3,600? And if so, are you willing to then eliminate the SALT deduction, which overwhelmingly benefits the wealthy, to give working families an expanded child tax credit that importantly never ends? So the president is very supportive of the child tax credit, proposes to continue it for several years until many of the provisions in the individual income tax um, from TCJA expire that affect uh, exemptions in the child tax credit, and then there'll need to be right. consideration of what to do as, right. as but, but those. Won't, but won't make that provision permanent is what you're saying. That, that would, the budget says it's going to expire in 25. That's, that's because there needs to be a broader consideration. It doesn't have to, though. You could put the, the child tax credit there and make that permanent. So we, we could, we well, could debate the tax cuts. Well, he's very supportive of it, and we would the, look to the, work with the, you to the make time sure of the that it's right. expired. Right. Senator Cantwell is next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Yellen, thank you so much for not just today, but over the weekend and the much attention you've given to this issue. It really does impact small businesses, and while the name of a bank might be Silicon Valley Bank, I guarantee you the innovation economy comes through Seattle, and probably many small businesses in my state were uh, impacted by, by what transpired. And why we need to make sure that the banking system really does have mechanisms that help the startup economy and the innovation. In my mind, that's why we did Chips and Science, is to let a lot of innovation unfold, but people have to get financing. So Jesse Salk, the grandson of Jonas Salk, is a molecular biologist and clinical oncologist who started Twin Strand Biosciences in the state of Washington. He and his team at Twin uh, Strand are developing cutting edge gene sequencing techniques to help us fight cancer. And he told my office this week that, quote, it was a big deal to step outside my comfort zone and start a company to help get a new genomic technology to, create, to help treat cancer patients faster. The last thing I expected us to need to think about was if we could rely on a bank. So the potential impact of Jesse's company having to pause or even cease operations due to banking failure isn't just jobs or dollars lost, which are important considerations to our economy. It's actually lives lost, too. So I, again, appreciate what the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, and everyone who stepped in. But it never should have happened in the first place. So my questions really are about these small businesses. Again, I think people think of them, oh, they're going to be giant businesses. But at their start, they are small businesses. So and and. I think Silicon Valley Bank was able to attract and, and help further this. So now where do we go? Where do we go? Are we going to push Jesse back towards a, a larger bank? Um, I'm, I'm curious. These, one of the reasons why there was so much of a concentration is that there was a requirement by the bank that you have all of your um, holdings in that bank. And so I want to hear what you think about that. How do we ensure that these small businesses uh, feel safe in, in putting their loans in? Are we just going to see, how do we, again, treat a startup economy and allow these funds to work cost effectively? And should we get rid of this requirement that they have to, uh, a requirement by a bank that says that they have to have, all, to get these terms, they have to have all their funds in that bank? So I'm not aware of the requirement that you mentioned, but certainly we want to make sure that depositors, whether they're individuals or households or small businesses, feel confident that the banks that they entrust um, their savings to or their um, working balances that they use to pay their workers, we want to make sure that they feel confident that these banks are safe and that they can do business with them. And um, that's an important reason why we stepped in with the FDIC and the Federal Reserve to intervene because um, I do believe the banking system in the United States is sound and resilient, and we wanted to make sure that the problems at Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank didn't undermine confidence um, in the soundness of banks around the country. And um, 
that we wanted to make sure that there wasn't contagion that could affect other banks and their depositors. Yep, so it's a, it's basically a requirement that they, it's a, you know, an affirmative covenant that they maintain all borrowers' depositors. That's something imposed by the bank, yes. I assume. Yes, on well, the startups as a way to corral. So I think this is why you had such a concentration and we should look at that as a particular issue. Um, what about Glass-Steagall? I've been a big supporter of Glass-Steagall. And when you come to this moment, and I keep thinking, why did we ever allow us to have the commingling of separation of commercial and investment banking? It seems to me that continuing to protect depositors and having a system where people can take risk and if they suffer loss, okay, but, but that's not what we have. We have such a commingled system now. What do you think about relooking at Glass-Steagall? Now, I'm not asking for the Treasury Secretary to make big news here. I'm really just asking if you thought this same situation would have occurred the way it occurred if we had not in 2000 gotten rid of Glass-Steagall. You know, we're very focused right now on stabilizing the banking system and shoring up confidence. And I think there will be um, plenty of time it will be appropriate to look at what happened and consider whether or not regulatory or supervisory changes are necessary and look forward to working with you in discussing what happened and what what response is appropriate, but for now, I would like to, I would like to see um, confidence restored in the soundness of American Thank banks. You. Well, I would just say this on this subject. I believe in the information age, and I believe one of America's secrets is access to capital. So I want great access to capital formation. I don't want to see these uh, in, uh, banking that understand startups go away. I don't want it to be concentrated at big banks, but I also uh, want us to make sure that we have a system that is, uh, I think we see now from 2009 what happened and now this incident that the commingling of these things are giving people, uh, I'm not sure that's the way we get access to capital. I'm not sure that that's, I, or at least we didn't have a system that protected us. It didn't protect us in the end. So well, we have to these, get something. These were I, depository I, institutions. They, they weren't um, investment banks. Yes. They were yes. Ma normal Madam Secretary, yes, we got, we, we, we've Thank got you. to move on. I happen to share Senator Cantwell's views with respect to this matter. Next is Senator Whitehouse and Senator Casey. Thank you, Secretary Yellen. I think you are the most available of all the cabinet members to come to hearings, and I just want you to know that I appreciate it. You seem quite fearless about coming into the lion's den, and we're always grateful to have you. You Thank spoke you. recently to the uh, Climate Financial Risk Advisory Committee, and in your remarks, you pointed out that climate change will likely become a source of shocks to the financial system uh, that would lead to declines, this would be precipitated by declines in asset values that could cascade through the financial system, which is a warning that Freddie Mac has also made with respect to coastal property values. Um, you added that rising insured losses could cause insurers to pull back from high-risk areas with potentially devastating consequences for property values. We just had a hearing in my budget committee on wildfire risk causing that effect to insurance and property markets. And before that, coastal flooding and storm risk yes. causing that effect in uh, insurance and property markets. And then that the whole thing can spill over to other parts of our interconnected financial system. Again, part of what Freddie Mac warned about that it would be worse than 2008. We also heard testimony that the coastal property value crash risk and the wildfire property risk could perfectly well happen at the same time. It's not a question of one or the other. Uh, they could both come to pass. So we all know that shocks and panics and collapses and disorderly transitions are notoriously hard to predict as to exactly when they will occur. They're far easier to predict as to what their level of severity will be should they occur. And my question to you, setting aside timing, how serious to the US economy 
could the economic shocks that you warned of in that speech be? So I don't know how to quantify that for you, but I do believe these are very serious risks. The Financial Stability Oversight Council is prioritizing, analyzing those risks, and has recognized that they pose a systemic threat to American financial stability. The regulators, the banking regulators, um, FHFA, um, are all taking steps to analyze the way in which these risks could affect fin the financial system, financial institutions, and we created the committee that you referred to in order to bring expertise into this enterprise, but I think it's critically, critically important in these are Potentially deadly serious. Risks, very severe risks. Um, and just to, for people who are not familiar with um, this particular uh, arena, the word systemic risk sounds like a rather mild and inoffensive term, but it actually refers to pretty devastating stuff, does it yes, not? Yes, that is what systemic refers to, exactly. Yeah. Things that could cascade throughout the financial system and have severe consequences for financial stability and the economy. Thank you. Um, in the time that I have left, I wanted to flag for you um, a letter that I will put into the record now, if I may, Mr. Chairman. An objection, so ordered. That a great number of us on this committee uh, signed to the acting director of FinCEN. The chairman was a signatory of it. Uh, Senator Grassley was a signatory of it. Uh, Senator Warren was a signatory of it. And uh, we are concerned that the um, development of the beneficial ownership rule has been far less than we had hoped and far less than we believed the actual statutory language directed, um, both regarding the so-called access rule, which is the subject of the letter, and regarding the verification standard, and regarding the court order requirement. If you would be good enough to take this back to your team and make sure that you have a look at this and make sure that you approve of where they are going, because I believe they have missed a very significant opportunity to significantly strengthen our battle against kleptocracy with the rather weak way in which uh, these three parts of the rule have been rolled out. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's for under advisement. Thank you. I take it that way. Senator Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Yellen, you, you uh, have been very patient. I'm the last questioner, and I'll try to keep within my time in light of your uh, appearance here. We're grateful for your time here. We're grateful for your service to the country. I did want to start just uh, preliminarily by noting in earlier questioning about the phone call return rate at the IRS, there have been statements made uh, today uh, that went, some of whom, some of which went unchallenged. And am I right to say that last year the phone call return rate at the IRS was about a low number, like 13 percent? Correct. And the current number is between 80 and 90 percent. That is correct. That is important for the public record, because I know that there's a narrative that the other side falsely um, is uh, perpetuating. So 80 to 90 percent is a hell of a lot better than 13. You don't have to comment on that, but I'll, I'll just it's, state that for the record. It's huge, huge improvement. And that's... And, you know, the, the IRS has been tremendously under-resourced, and the resources that Congress provided through the IRA are critically important. They hired 5,000 um, customer service representatives, have made enormous progress in working through the paper backlog, and are now, we're going to see continued improvements and, you know, great improvements in customer service. Thanks so much for that. I want to talk to you first about uh, more broadly energy communities, in particular coal communities. I live in Scranton, Pennsylvania, born and raised there, still live there, and uh, happens to be the hometown of the president. But we, we live in a region that has 
basically five counties that were so-called anthracite, hard coal counties, historically. And then in southwestern Pennsylvania, you have a, a much larger number of counties that were so-called bituminous or soft coal counties. I don't have to tell you, most Americans know the story of what happened to that industry. We're told, though, most recently that the uh, Appalachian Regional Commission reports that coal employment has fallen by some 62 percent over the last decade, leading to broader decline in the region. Um, and that's true in, in these communities in Pennsylvania. The report, uh, the, they, the report also indicates that overall private sector employment in, in Appalachian coal counties, that would of course go to West Virginia and several other uh, states, has been flat since the Great Recession, but it was increasing in the non-coal communities. In the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, I fought for a, an additional tax credit of 10 percent that would encourage private companies to build new energy and manufacturing projects in these energy communities. To date, the Treasury Department has not released guidance on how companies can claim these credits or uh, guidance on what exactly or what exact areas qualify. So without that guidance, companies have been reluctant to announce new projects in these coal or energy communities, and we've seen new investment flowing to non-energy communities. So I'd, I'd ask you um, to tell us, if you can, when can Pennsylvania and other states that have these coal communities expect Treasury to finalize the rules, the guidance, so these coal country communities can get their share of new jobs and investment? This is a tremendously important provision. We recognize how hard hit these communities are and how important this bonus is. I can tell you that my staff is working utterly around the clock to write and implement these regulations. They're tremendously complex and we will do this. It's a priority item. We will do this as quickly as we possibly can. Um, I, I typically have several meetings a week with tax policy to make sure that things are moving as rapidly as we um, can make humanly possible, and this is a priority item for us. Thank you, Secretary. I appreciate that. And the, the, the next question I think I'll, I'll submit for the record, just want to preview it for you. We have this bizarre circumstance in the tax code where uh, corporations are given a tax break for, uh, for activities that are often union-busting activities, so they get a tax break for that. And at the same time in the 2017 bill, tax bill passed here in the Senate, uh, a provision for union dues deduction and work expense deductions were taken away from individuals. So the worker got a tax tax break taken away, and, and uh, big corporations have had this uh, benefit to, to allow them to union bust and get a break for it. I have a No Tax Breaks for Union Busting Act with 30 of our colleagues that I'm trying to pass, and I'll ask you a specific question about that. But in the interest of time, I'll submit that for the record. Thanks very much. Thank you, Senator. Ma Madam Secretary, I very much uh, share Senator Casey's views. I'm on uh, his legislation for no tax breaks for union busting. And I think you all had that dialogue about the energy communities provision. Um, Madam Secretary, I think we call it a, a priority. I'd like to designate it a super priority because Senator Casey led the effort for those energy communities in the effort on the IRA. And I know it's extraordinarily important to a host of these uh, communities where there's a history of one energy policy and we've got to get them to help Senator Casey's measure and vision. So I, th I thank him um, for it. Um, Madam Secretary, we're gonna let you leave in the kind of two minutes that I think we may have remaining so we keep you on the clock. As usual, you have accounted for yourself very well today. Thank you, and Chair. And I especially appreciate your saying for what I believe is the first time that prioritization of debt ceiling payments is just unworkable. That is Correct. the message that needs to go out far and wide this committee uh, and let the record show. The secretary has again said that's correct. 
uh, this committee has jurisdiction over these issues relating to the full faith and credit of the United States. So I very much appreciate what you're saying to us, <clears throat> your comments about clean energy, your comments about housing. You had the waterfront in front of you to, uh, to talk about, and I just want to make one point in wrapping up. <clears throat> Republicans in their tax amendments, these various tax amendments, define taxable income so as to give many billionaires a free pass on taxes. And that is really what the difference is. We feel very strongly about protecting all those firefighters and nurses and all the small business people. We all share that view. We are just unwilling, as are you and the president, to your credit, to give billionaires a free pass. And it is all about how these amendments define taxable income, which would basically keep billionaires from getting audited or paying little, if any, taxes for years on end. So we look forward to working with you in the days ahead. Um, for the information members, uh, questions for the record for the secretary are due at 5 p.m. next Thursday, March 23rd, and the Finance Committee. And we thank you again. Secretary Yellen is adjourned. Thank you, Chair Wyden.